Right, let me invite my guest. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. Looks like looks like we're live, and I'm gonna invite some folks. All right, and it looks like how's it going, sir? Hello, good sir. I'm going to see if I can change how this looks. And I said I wasn't going to crack. I said I wasn't going to crack open a beer until we started, so now I can start. Okay, now, now, you, now you can start. There you go. Let's see. Was that no, I, may, put... hmm? I, I may not know how to change to where you look bigger on the screen. Um, believe it or not, I don't know how to do that either. I've tried. <laughs> you think it would be an easy thing, right? Yeah, but that would make sense. We can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Settings. If it makes sense, the here. enemy would expect that. Right. Ah, all right. Thank you, Juiced. I go to multi-guest settings. Okay. Yep. Uh, nope, that's not it. Okay, apparently I am on multi guest. Ah, here we go. Oh shit! Ah, there we are. All right. See, I'm I'm, gl I'm glad. Hey Tanya, I'm I'm glad that people have my back and are uh, teaching me how to use this darn thing. Dude, you got your All own right. moderators. You got your own moderators. You got your own IT support. It's great, right? I I, I know, right? It's it's uh. Um, yeah, this is definitely a better experience than I've had with other social media. So hello to everyone who's joining us. Uh, got started a few few minutes early, but uh, I am here with Michael, uh, copyright 347, and he is uh, a book narrator uh, and overall awesome dude. And I am Rick Treon, uh, author and book editor, and uh, apparently host of Book Talk on Book Talk because nobody else has told me that they use it. And uh, even though we're going to talk about a lot more than books, uh, I feel like that is uh, – thank you, Roseberry. Yes, you, you saved me. Now I know how to do that. Um, but, no, I, I definitely have found uh, a little bit of a home uh, interviewing people and uh, being on panels and uh, sort of hosting events. And so I've been able to translate that here to the online space a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I don't like talking into the void, but whenever I have somebody else – uh, to do some of the talking for us, uh, and then Rick Bell is saying hi to you, and we're getting uh, getting a lot of people joining us, which is uh, which is great. So uh, I may or may not have gone to my story and said, "Hey, y'all, I'm going to be in a live with this dude in about ten wow. minutes. We're going to be talking." I'm trying to remember what I said. I said he's an author, he's a writer, and then I realized that those two were almost the same thing. But I, and I said we're going to be talking about everything from books, philosophy, whatever we feel like talking about. We'd love to have you. Come on, stop by. Yeah. Well, I, and you know, it's funny you bring up uh, writer versus author. So uh, in mm -hmm. my mind, in my mind, there's a little separation. So uh, people yeah. say they're, they're an aspiring writer. It's like, well, no, if you write, if you sit down at a computer periodically mm -hmm. and write, then you're a writer. Uh, author to me does denote somebody who has been published. I, and, in, uh, so, I thought about that too. Yeah. And so when people say they're, they're, they're an aspiring author or uh, uh, an, uh, yet to be published author like that, that makes uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, right. So, uh, but you know, at, at the same time, we do live in an age where you can, uh, you know, self-publish. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing to stop people from being an author. And of course, there are those snobby people who are like, well, if you self-publish, that doesn't count. But we don't uh, we don't worry about those folks um, because that is that... keyboard warriors and everything. 
Well, and that's a, that's like a, 20, 20 years ago, you know, yes, the very first people. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tiny still, this is not the pair I expected in my life today. Well, you know, life is full of surprises, and we are glad that we could uh, we could surprise you. That's uh, um, uh, that's one of life's little joys, right? Uh, and then, and then Sarah says, "Self-publishing is how you start." It, it absolutely, mm-hmm. it, it absolutely can be. And, and you know, uh, it, it used to be those were the outliers, and they still are. I mean, most most people. Uh, um, hey, Shackworth, uh, you're working on and listening. Um, want to write a book, but you're so intimidated. You know, it's uh, I can see why that would be right because it seems like it's a ton of words, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, there are so many people Work out there. Hard. Who, who are already doing it um you know you're you're in the middle of uh you know working to get your stuff uh published uh how do you um handle those moments when you think this is you know this is such a crazy difficult thing that i'm trying to do you know uh how how do you handle it so are we talking about the voice acting or like the little two books that i have started but they're like which one are you uh, talking the, about? The, the, the books. The books. <laughs> so for me, for me, what kind of makes it a bit, a little bit less intimidating, the idea that I have about it is that essentially it's, I have something and I have something that I've written. I think I've written about like 80 something pages at this point. And there are times where it gets intimidating because I've kind of hit this wall and it's a wall that's literally been in place since summer of 2020. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I go back to it and I read it and it oftentimes when you write something, then you go back and then you read it. You're like, Oh dude, I hate this. I hate this. Scratch this, scratch that. I'm still going back and reading it. And I'm like, dang, no, I, I, I got some good stuff in here. Um, I might want to change up this and this. So for me, the idea of trying to pick it up again, it, in all honesty, it isn't today. It's like, okay, well, well, what if, what if I don't have the good ideas that I had back then? And what if like the headspace that I was in at that time is not going to be the same as now. And then if I try to do it again, it's going to make it sound totally different. I'm going to have to, it's like, dude, just stop, stop. Take what you have, take what, you know, you have in your head, put it on the freaking page. There is, there is time afterwards to, to go through it, find what you like, find what you don't, but don't get caught in that analysis paralysis of, quite literally getting in your own way. You yeah. know, it's if you're not sure if you want to go on a trip or if you're not sure if you want to go here or there and you're just sitting in your driveway debating on whether or not you should start your car, start your car. And yeah. after you start your car and pull out the driveway, you still don't want to go. Okay, let's reassess. But if you don't start your car, then dang sure you ain't going to go anywhere. And there's a chick in the cowboy hat. Oh, thanks, Wild Horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, saw that one too. So, uh, you know, I I often um, use the analogy, or I, I call it someone's publishing journey, and there, and there's a reason for that. It's because you know um, the, the old cliche that you know every journey starts with you know that first step, and yep. you know if, if you think about going from even just starting a project to having a uh, a, a finished draft, a finished first draft. If you think about it as a journey, it's like, yes, you know, you, you start with one sentence and two sentences and a paragraph and it all adds up and mm-hmm. you have to treat it as, you know, a finish line that you're trying to get to and, and it has to be a marathon. Uh, and I know mm-hmm. that people go through writing sprints when they talk about getting their words down, but it, it is absolutely for marathon runners, they will know even more than I do because I do not run marathons. But, um, you know, each step you take, get you closer to that goal. And I do like long road trips. So that was a good analogy about sitting in your car for me is that, yeah, you know, if I'm going to drive to to Nashville, which I've done a couple of times over the years for conferences and stuff. uh, Yeah. It's, it's like a two, it's like a two day trip. You know, you stay halfway and you think, Mm -hmm. man, it's going to take me so long to get there, but you know, Mm -hmm. then you get, you get to Oklahoma city. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm on my way. And then you get to the next town, you stop halfway in Conway. And so, you know, you just have to take each, each, uh, each section. Publishing is mm-hmm. a rough ride going through the query process. Yeah, yeah. And and we're just talking about getting a first draft down and then, you know, going through querying and uh, finding an editor or, you know, self-publishing, which is its own process and which is not, uh, you know, not any easier I- in many ways. Uh, so, you know, both of those paths to publication uh, come with their own um, sets of speed bumps. Uh, so, yeah, you know, that's uh, 
uh, that, that's that's a, a great analogy, and that's why self publishing is fantastic. And you know, I did not do it to begin my uh, writing career. I have four novels that have been published traditionally from uh, two small presses, uh, which operate like the big guys, but on a much smaller scale. And it's mostly because I did not want to learn how to make or source covers, and I did not want to do that work that comes with self-publishing. Um, I just wanted to send it to somebody and have them turn it into a book. And I was fortunate enough that uh, some folks wanted um, wanted to do that for me. Um, but now that I, I know more about it and it has become uh, easier to do on your own, we have much better technology out there on the web than when I was trying to do it back in uh, you know, 2018 was when I was getting serious about getting my stuff published. So, you know, that's, uh, um, uh, we got so many comments coming in, you know, it's definitely, uh, I'm going to have to start targeting people with really, really big followings and making them the people that I interview because this is, uh, um, this, this we is great. I know. I mean, um, so yeah. It, you know, uh, uh, I know that, that some people were talking about being, uh, uh, being intimidated, and we, we, we discussed that a little bit. Uh, but there are definitely, uh, I think, uh, a lot of folks who, uh, okay, they, they, yeah, there it is, the question about ghostwriters. So yeah. um, uh, I do not use a ghostwriter. You know, you're not using a ghostwriter. Uh, a lot of times those are for, all right, uh, looks like you got a guitar there, buddy. <laughs> uh, um, but the um, uh, ghostwriting is something that I actually do. Uh, for, for some folks, uh, or, or we're, we're trying to get that set up. And uh, that is for people who have a great idea and are um, are not themselves confident enough to sit down and write. And so they would like to have somebody to translate their, um, mm -hmm. uh, their idea in, into word form. And that is something that, uh, that I can do and that I have done. Uh, so I'm actually a ghost writer for some people as opposed to using uh, a ghostwriter, but, uh, you know, those are, uh, usually for celebrities, uh, quite honest. And if, if you keep getting a big TikTok following, you will yourself be a celebrity and you may want to use a ghostwriter to get your stories finished rather than, uh, uh, or if you're, uh, if you're James Patterson, you just team up with, uh, every author on the planet and you have them write your stories too. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it looks like, uh, because this is mostly, uh, your audience at, at this point, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, talk a, a little bit about the uh, the narration and the voice acting acting part of it? Because uh, a lot of people ask me questions about like about that, and I don't have great answers for them. So, um, well, one one of the big ones is uh, what do you read off of whenever you're doing a narration for anything? Do you uh, have like a tablet? Do you print things out? Is that easier for you? How do you how do you do that? Because I know that. I would never be able, like, I don't know how I would get my brain to, to do that correctly. So for me, um, when I record and I'm actually reading off something, I will physically print it out. Mm -hmm. The reason why I say that is that for me, it it is a really, really dumb um, mind game, at least for myself. But when I'm reading off a piece of paper, it, to me, kind of helps me emote. Because when I have something on paper, it's I'm reading it. That's it. When I'm on my laptop, there's so many dang things I use on my laptop, whether it's email, this, 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 whatever. But when I have something physically printed out in front of me, I'm doing one or two things. I'm reading it or, um, or I'm actually reading it out loud. I'm either sitting down reading it quietly in my head or I'm reading it out loud. So it kind of takes away the distractions from it. And it's also something physical that I can mark down right in front of me if there's something where nope i forgot this part hey this part we want to sound a little bit more like this i can sit right there and i can take a sharpie or a highlighter or whatever and just immediately do it it's a physical thing that i have in my hands that i can work with versus a oh hold on let me type and do this and this and this and now i'm just no i have it physically written in front of me and i can work with it and so as far as like you know, between uh, printed out paper, laptop, anything, I prefer having like physical paper in front of me because I can work with that. It's it's almost like having my notes during class or during a speech or something like that. I can physically work with it in front of me. I don't got to worry about technical difficulties. I don't got to worry about the little paper clip at the bottom of the screen asking me if I'm writing a letter. For those of y'all who remember that little guy, <laughs> um, you know, and I can just um, 
sorry, anytime someone sends me one of these, I've told them I have to do this every time. Also, if you hear me say Riverside out of nowhere, it's because someone brought up Alabama. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of, speaking of technical difficulties, I'm going to see somebody wants to get on here, so I'm going to try and accepting their invite and seeing what happens. And I would also have to print out a piece of paper, I think, because yeah. I, I want to be distracted. You want to be careful with that one, too, Alabama. Roll Todd. Um, you want to be careful with that one, generally, if it's not people who you know. Uh, you know, they have a good connection. I would generally say don't have someone coming live, and I only say that oh. because between where people are and, and, and uh, connections bouncing off each other, it will it can just kill the whole life. It's, yeah. It's, okay. Well, yeah, it looks like she was online. It is uh, Mrs. Country Badass's birthday today, so happy birthday. Birthday. It's fun. I had to had to make sure that I, I stopped and uh, saw saw who that was that uh, wishing him a happy birthday. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I, I would have to have like just paper and because whenever I'm writing, I have to go somewhere and um, I have to put my phone face down. I have no, um, mm -hmm. no nothing coming at me. It's uh, <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, I and it's uh, somebody's birthday tomorrow. That is uh, L Grover four. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, a bit challenging. Well, yes, it is, but that's why, especially when you're narrating, <laughs> you do it piece by piece by piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, trying to narrate like a whole book in like no, like that. That's like trying to even just reading a whole book in one sitting is um, is an endeavor in and of itself. Um, it's a massive pain in the neck. And um, so with like a book, generally what I'll do or what I've done so far um, is I literally do it about like chapter by chapter. Get one chapter done, cool, done, go to the next part, get a chapter done, cool, mm. done, go to the next part. And I'll have each chapter printed out individually. And a lot of it has to do with, again, it's on my notes. And in my notes, I'll have things like, um, like I color code things. So especially as I go from accent to accent, will have, um, you know, one character I have highlighted in one color. I know that's a mid-American oh, okay. accent. One character, I always use pink for women. So if it's in pink, I know that it's a female character. <coughs> Pardon me. I know that it's a female character. I need to bring my voice up a little bit. And then I color code them so I know before I get to reading it, what accent or what dialogue or what character I need to have in my brain um, while I'm reading it. Um, and I always try to take that pause and obviously you can edit out the pauses and stuff like that, but that's what I do. And, um, yeah, I generally do it or try to do it chapter by chapter by chapter, because if you just keep going and going and going, you burn yourself out. Um, but even like the way that I read is that like, if I have a chapter where something suspenseful happens at the end of that chapter and picks up in the next chapter, th there's no, there's no pause. It's like, no, take, take the, take the uh, momentum or emotion or this or that that's going on in this chapter that immediately follows in the next chapter and just run with it because it's almost like when it's almost like watching a movie or when you're just reading the book itself, you know, or like that cliffhanger at the end of the walking dead episode, you kind of get the moment of like, no, yep. no, no. What's, the, what's the next thing? And you lose it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, so as far as doing a whole book on paper, no. I mean, if, if needed, if I had no other option, yes, I will literally sit there with the book and push in my mouth at the mic just the right way. Yeah. You know that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold a bicep curl here for a good two hours while I'm flipping from page and just with arms, then okay. <laughs> but. And, and you know, uh, it, it's, it's funny. I have had to... Uh, um, rethink a little bit sometimes whenever I'm whenever I'm going back and revising, and thinking about what the the narrator might uh, might have to do depending on what I'm writing, um, because uh, my first book, which was uh, turned into an audio book, deep background, the uh, voice actor reached out to me, and uh, you, we went over some pronunciation things and and, and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, uh, and there were some words that I used. I looked up and done some research, and I didn't know how to pronounce them. And I couldn't mm -hmm. offer any help. And so it's like, oh, okay. So, you know, that's something to, to keep in mind. And then for, um, uh, yes, we, we are talking about books. 
uh, and we, we, uh, we and, and we have me, uh, me, the author and the editor, and then uh, Michael Copperhead over there is a, a narrator. And so right now we're talking about how that interaction works. And so, yeah, I could not offer any help on how to pronounce stuff for the next book that was actually not turned into an audio book, even though it was planned. Um, you know, I came up with a little uh, pronunciation dictionary with some stuff, you know, that was either uh, very unique to my uh, region here in the Texas Panhandle, uh, town names uh, and stuff like that. And, and uh, I think, you know, if I know if I'm expecting a book to become uh, a narrator or to become an audio book, then I'm probably just going to do that on my own just to make sure. Because uh, I really felt bad that there was some stuff I could not uh, could not help that, that gentleman with. Um and then I also think about sometimes you're talking about how if a chapter cuts off in the middle of the suspense, uh, some chapters are great that way. But if uh, if you are um, not necessarily doing it that way or you're changing point of views, um, I definitely because people do stop at chapters. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I try to make sure that I ground them in the scene uh, very mm -hmm. early. And I think about that, whereas I, I didn't necessarily before because, oh, thank you for the heart. We appreciate it. Um, because, you know, hopefully, and I write thrillers and, and suspenseful stuff, hopefully they're turning the pages and they're just in it and they don't really uh, come out. But for people who are listening to an audiobook, they're, who knows whenever they're going to have to stop and, you know, get out of the car if that's where they listen or when their chores are done or however they're doing it. So I'm a little more conscious of that as I review. Thank you for the heart. We, uh, we love getting those. Um, so, yes, uh, we, we definitely have to think more about it. They know that every time they do that, I'm going to have to do this. They're just making the monkey dance at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so yes, we we are here. We are we are talking about uh, talking about books and talking about narration, and uh, we're listening to Michael's great voice. Uh, I think most of us on here could just listen listen to him all day, and that's uh, that's not necessarily a gender thing. Although I can, oh, uh, now that's cool. Oh, that's living. cool, little puppy. Oh, yeah. oh love that. It's a, and it's specifically a corgi. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, so yeah, do, do you uh, do you have any books um, that have that you've narrated that people can go out and uh, and listen to right now? Uh, officially, you can find. Unfortunately, not yet. I am very mm. much the beginning of that journey now. Um, if you go on um, ACX, um, you will find you'll find me on there, um, and you'll find two that I did um, that uh, the lovely Miss Tanya, who I cannot thank enough and is very much my angel and my big sis, and at this point is pretty much my manager, um, is in here, um, that she set up the whole thing and took me under her wing from the very beginning. And um, let's see, uh, Angel Audio would like to be added if possible tonight. Oh, cool. Speaking right. of Tanya. Um, yeah. But right. Tanya. From, from day one, from the very beginning, Tanya just took me under her wing and was, is literally, as far as this endeavor goes, as far as the world of getting into the professional voice narrations and all that, she is, she is my angel, she is my manager, yeah. she is, and you ain't changed my mind, you know, depending on how big it gets, you know, I don't care who I work for. If they tell me that they want me to work with somebody else or they want someone else to be a manager, it's like, no, nope, you get me and Tanya or you get nothing. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Maybe. No, like, like <laughs> it. I would and, not um, be live at all without, without Tanya. And we have Angel Audio who, uh, who wanted to join. Uh, are you with us? Hello, ma'am. Hey, can you hear me? We yes, can. And, and it's Angela. Hey. Angela Audio. It's Angela. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Good to see you. Well, she was, you know what? She's been messaging me every time you do a yeah. live. She's like, she's like, check it out, check it out. So, you know, finally I was here. Well, and, and for me, I just, I have, um, I live and die on my Google calendar now, which, which is with a calendar on my, on my phone, which I never had to do, but I do so many different things and I'm on so many different places that, uh, that I, I just, I have to, after this holiday, during the holiday, I'm going to schedule stuff out and, and in, invite people, but uh, you also have a really uh, great voice. I, I absolutely hate my voice. Uh, whenever I was a journalist, I would have to transcribe the interviews I did, and I would just want to fast forward through all of it, and I would cringe. Uh, you know, here's a question yeah. for both of you. At what point, what did you get feedback that told you that, yes, you know, I have a voice that could translate to this sort of stuff? Uh, and, or, or at what point were you like, yes, this is something that I could do 
and that people will like it and and you know pay me for it. Either. Uh, Miss Angela, you are by far the more talented out of the two of us. So I'm gonna have oh, please, no, don't even, don't even. Your videos, oh, I, oh, wow, I, just, I mean, girl, I just did, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your voice, you just know it, right? Look at Dude, your, I, I mean, arguments. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I just have a different background. I have a background in music. I, I'm a journalist so i connect with you on that respect um oh, and i was like oh look at the heart um i was a broadcast journalist for a very long time okay. so i was on the radio um so it just it it was it was a natural progression for me because it combined um all the things that i love which is performance and talking into a microphone and reading books and i love i narrate romance and i love romance so much i just mm -hmm. i'm a romance reader so um, it's just now, you know, I get paid to stand in a room by myself and read romance out loud, which is perfect. So that's kind of, that's, you know, but I also don't like listening to my own voice. Oh my God. I, <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> At all. But, but, but I think that's, we're all self-critical, right? I mean, I don't know, Copperhead, do you like listening to yourself? Do you I, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you have uh, a beautiful voice, you know that. So, well, thank you, ma'am. Um, I mean, for me, the, the all, all, so here's two things. Two things that I, I swear I got body dysmorphia and voice dysmorphia because I, <laughs> whenever anyone's just like, you're so handsome, I'm like, don't look good. You see me, and then I look in the mirror, and I'm like, I don't, I don't see it. But I also have almost like voice dysmorphia because we'll be like, you have such a low voice, and you have like this calm, low, smoothing mm -hmm. voice. And then when I hear myself, I'm like, my voice ain't that deep, is it? Like, to me, my <laughs> voice is almost and annoying. But then again, I've been living with it for 30 years, so that might be why. Um, yeah. And it, and it, it kind of goes into um, what you were saying, Rick, as far as, like, you know, did someone tell you and this and this? And for me, it was kind of, yeah. It was two, two things that, that really kind of um, clued my brain into it you will always hear your own voice differently. At the same time, it was, a, it was one of my music teachers that said, listen, if I tell you you're doing good, you're doing good. You're probably not gonna like the sound of your own voice, and that's fine. If you're on key and you're doing well, I will tell you. But if you don't, if you hate the sound of your own voice, that's you bringing your own personal thing into it. <laughs> don't think that you're doing a bad job. If I'm telling you you're doing a good job, you're doing a good job. I was like, all right, yeah. cool. And then through here was, again, people were like, dude, I could listen to you, like, you know, read the phone book. I could listen to you <laughs> talk about Versus yep. me, my head, where I'm like, dude, I hate hearing the sound of my own voice. <laughs> but part of it is that, oddly enough, it's science. So if you think about it, when you hear yourself talk, number one, there's all the mental parts of it. Like I said, body is <laughs> morphia, whatever you want to call it. But you're hearing the vibration of your voice in your own head within your bone structure around your ears. Yeah. Everybody else is hearing it physically come from somewhere mm -hmm. out. So you automatically, hands down, every single time, hear your voice differently than yeah. everybody else does. And there is almost no possible way to hear your voice the way everybody else does. So... Yeah. Again, to me, it's one of those things where it's like, as long as I'm meeting the objective, as long as I'm doing something that I feel like I gave the best that I could, and I'm getting that feedback from our people like, no, this is exactly how I want that to sound. This is exactly what I had in mind, and you delivered it perfectly and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to trust y'all because I'm <laughs> <worse."> <laughs> I've had I've had a lot of coaches. I've done a lot of training, and mm -hmm. the 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 thing that I I've heard the most is stop listening to yourself. Yes, because you have those earphones on, and you're like, mm -hmm. and then you can tell, right? Because you disconnect with the text, and you don't mm -hmm. perform it. You don't connect with it emotionally, and and that's and that's what I've learned. I just I sometimes I just take my headphones off and just narrate mm -hmm. because I get too much into my head thinking, oh, I'm not sounding. I'm not sounding mm -hmm. smooth. I'm sounding too low. I'm sounding too high. And then I start critiquing my own voice rather than focusing on the performance, which, I'm, as I'm you very... said. No, go ahead. No, which, as you said, is, I mean, that's the important part, right? So I'm curious, does this happen to you with accents as well? 
where you're doing a specific dialect and you almost think that you don't sound that dialect enough. Like, so for me personally, so I had someone on here who actually mm -hmm. asked me about and the big thing, the only reason I know how to do an English accent was that I've got a friend of mine who lives across the pond in the London, in the UK. And every now and again, I don't know where I would switch to the multi dialectalism, but I'll talk to him and I'll basically, you know, sort of sound like this. And I'll do it more to amuse him and like kind of play around with him a bit, you know. But he's like, hey, <laughs> I'd say you were from fucking Manchester, mate. Like, you sound very similar. But then, like, for me, when I've done, like, certain things, whether it's an acting or theatre and stuff like that, I'm like, do I sound English enough? Like, do I sound Manchester enough? And everyone's right. like, dude, you sound just like it. Like, what's your problem? I'm like, yeah, but I don't think I sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right there you did. That sounded fantastic. Mm. Um like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's different. I, I probably, I've heard, I've seen some of your videos where you've done your accents and they're all fantastic. I am not an expert in accents. So I, I haven't done as many in narration <coughs> as I hope to. So um, I, I think I might encounter that at some point. But um, when I do try, I, I, listen, I just listen to myself too much. Mm -hmm. I listen to myself too much. That's know? why on your phone you know, now. Early. Yeah. Headphone. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny for writers because I, um, you know, because because writers try to write with accents too, right? And to make things sound uh, authentic and that sort of thing. And uh, whenever I'm I'm helping out a writer either by editing their book or just you know giving notes, and even myself when I go through re revisions of my own stuff, um, the the key when you're when you're writing uh, it, to to get people because people know what those accents sound like you know well enough right like you know scottish or english or irish or you know boston versus california cool versus um texas and then people usually default to west texas and you know uh we could we could go on about that but the point is people can kind of get it uh what you have to do uh in writing is do it with your word choice and uh just a very few like if it's Texas, you drop a you drop a few G's, uh, you know, you you throw in a, a y'all or an all y'all when it would be really used. You know, don't do it just to be performing is not the right word, but but just to say, oh, you know, hey, we're in Texas, by the way. It has to come through the natural dialogue. Well, no, I, fine, because I know for a fact that everyone will take y'all five minutes. And it's like, no, it's not how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are rules. There are rules to y'all and all y'all, believe it or not. Uh, and, and so I read people and they try to, uh, misspell words to get the phonetics right and all that stuff and eventually becomes, uh, illegible. And even if they are accurate with how it would sound, it does not come across that way as you're reading. And it's a, it's a strange thing that your mm -hmm. brain does because your brain is just going to go, okay, I can't, these aren't even words to me anymore. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. And then, so for you guys, whenever you come across a book that has that kind of stuff in it. You know, how do you do you have to take a take a few beats and maybe read through uh, when they introduce a new character to kind of think about what you think that character sounds like before you start uh, start reading uh, in, in a certain accent? Like, how does that work uh, whenever you guys are trying to voice uh, the accents that we as the writers have put on the page? Well, well, for me, a lot of prep goes into it. So right now I'm prepping a book that I'm recording at the end of January with lots of Irish accents. And I have an Irish accent, um, but I need it needs to be better than it is right now. So, so before I do, Welsh, um, have you ever heard of Mrs. Brown's Place? The the show Mrs. Brown's Place. No. All right. If you ever get a chance to sit down <laughs> in to um the show called Mrs. Brown's Place, <laughs> and, um, it's on the BBC, and uh, it's. Called absolute great comedy i love uh, it's an absolute fucking amazing comedy and mm -hmm. the great thing that i love about that is that in the cast you've got about three different dialects of um of an irish accent so you've got dublin in there you've got yeah. roughly about kind of like a monster sort of style in it um and uh leah yes i did just bring up mrs brown's boys love so sit down <laughs> wait your <laughs> um but, I mean, for me, growing up, that was the biggest thing that let me sort of click into a lot of different dialects is that I sat down and I watched the BBC, and that was the big thing for me, is that I sat yeah. down and listened to, rather than people 
like Americans playing Brits or yeah. playing Irish. I was listening to Irish playing Irish or the Scots playing Scots or the English playing the English. So you've got a lot of different dialects in there that you can sort of play around with. And it really depends on the person because different people, depending on your mindset, depending on just the way it's going to sound, probably a bit fucking awkward, but the way your mouth works, um, as far as what feels natural to you, you'll find your niche in there. And for me, it was always, if I didn't understand something, if there was an accent I didn't fully understand, or there was one that I didn't fully grasp, I enveloped myself in it. And a big part of that, a big, big part of that for me, oddly enough, was Mrs. Brownie's bias. Um <laughs> I just fucking love the show. It's just hilarious as it is. And, uh, and then obviously being in Ireland um, for about two weeks when I was there, uh, when I came back from deployment, you really got to hear um, directly from all the different parts of the country. You got to hear it from Dublin, from Kerry, from Limerick, from Galloway, from Waterford, and from everywhere else. So that's my biggest thing is that if you're trying to grasp Irish, just envelop yourself in it. Because if you really think about it, just dialects in and of themselves are just languages. And you've got people who, you know, you, you're an Italian who plays on an American football team. I don't speak a lick of English. But you, if you immerse yourself in in English speakers, you learn how to speak English. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts right now. A lot of Irish you. podcasts, right? Um, I'm listening to a lot of Irish podcasts while I'm out and about. So yeah, I'm going to add that to my list. Thank you for the recommendation. But yeah, it's important, right? You don't want to hear an American doing... <laughs> um, yeah, you don't want to learn from an American or Canadian, where I'm from, uh, doing an Irish or a British accent. You want to learn from the people, the native speakers, for sure. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, um, I took uh, all this Spanish in high school and college. Like, I think if you total it up, uh, it, it was like it was like five and a half years worth of studying Spanish in school. And I, I still cannot, uh, you know, get my mouth to, to roll my R's and do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, I learned more Spanish and learned how to speak it better whenever I was working on an oil pipeline uh, in Oklahoma and in parts around Texas, uh, while I was uh, working with my friend and, um, you know, doing it for research for a book. And also because the money's insane in an oil pipeline, there's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, like, you know, and what's funny is I was learning a different language. I was learning, uh, like South Texas, uh, or, or Spanglish, uh, you know, and that's like a, that's like a, a legitimate, like recognized, uh, dialect, you know, for, for folks who, uh, you know, are first or second generation um, uh, immigrants over here and who are who are speaking Spanish uh, in America and, you know, specifically around the border. Hey, we got video now for Angela. Hi. Hello. And, uh, <laughs> Continue. And, and so and so, yes, that was absolutely I came out of there being able to understand and speak uh, and communicate uh, way better with with a lot of, uh, of a lot of my, my new friends that I had from from working out there. And so, yeah, there's just, they're, they're you know, learning it, uh, you know, with, with uh, people who are not native speakers just uh, is, is, not, is not the same. Um, I've been trying to keep up with all the questions, Blow, and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard. But you know, for, the, for those of you who, uh, um, who oh, uh, speaking Polish, and, and, and so, yeah, uh, all, these, all these accents, uh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that all I have to do is very subtly get that across on the page, not have to actually do it. Uh, do it like you guys do. So um, how do you do that? I'm curious. So when you are writing accents or you're writing, say you're writing Irish characters, what do you do um, to uh, make sure that you're? So, so yeah, like generally, generally with accents and uh, because I, I edit and, and more write spy sort of stuff, it's usually more Slavic stuff like, uh, like Russian and, uh, and um, you know, Ukrainian and that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it is, is word choice or, or like say there was a historical um, um, uh, I, uh, Italian mob uh, story that was actually set uh, in the, you know, around Al Capone and all of his stuff up in Chicago. Uh, and so what we did, what I did with the author when I was working with him is uh, first you use uh, like the, the real uh, Italian word, like um, you have like mistress, which is a, uh, um, uh, a guma, I think is kind of how it, how it comes, comes across, but it's, 
It's actually uh, like if I were to speak it in Spanish, which is the closest thing I know, it would be like cumare, uh, C-U-M-A-R-E, and that's the actual word. And so rather than it turning into a bad episode of The Sopranos and us trying to make it sound phonetically, you use the, the real words, you don't put them in italics because uh, what that does is that kind of um, makes it sound like they are uh, doing something special when in reality, all they're doing is using a word from their native tongue. Um, and then also there is a sentence structure, uh, which comes across if it's a first generation and it's, uh, it's other word choice if uh, you don't have them using uh, sophisticated English, uh, English words and English um, sentence structure when they would not be able to do that if they were a first or second generation Italian uh, living um, in, in and around Chicago. And so those are the sort of things that uh, as an author, you should be looking for when you're trying to um, establish, you know, the way someone sounds in terms of uh, their dialect. Uh, you don't do much with the actual accent because reading is uh, a medium, and this goes for visually too, where your goal uh, is to get the reader to project their own sounds and visions and tastes onto the story you're trying to tell. They are going to make the characters look like they want to. Who I, who I picture when I write is not what you're gonna picture when you're reading, and it couldn't be, right? There's just no possible way to do that. Um, but if you give enough little clues that they are going to uh, form the way that their person sounds. And I'll tell you, sometimes when I'm reading just internally, um, even if I know someone speaking with a British accent, let's say, I may not necessarily hear them speaking British because uh, that's just my brain doesn't want to do it and it wants them to sound American and they're just in America and not in England. And it's definitely not what the what the writer wanted, but it never takes away from my enjoyment of the book. Um, and, and I've caught myself doing that a few times and thinking, wow, I could not at all ever be uh, an audiobook narrator because I would do that. I would not. Uh, I would just read it because, you know, it, they're going to sound like how I want them to sound. And so that, um, uh, and that must be interesting to be reading a story, but not actually reading it, you know, as a reader, but reading it for a different purpose. It must have to be a little more mechanical than if you're sitting there in your cozy couch, just uh, turning the pages, which is why, uh, you know, I was asking Michael about, uh, you know, what he uses to read, you know, he prints out the pages. Uh, what, yeah. what do you do, Angela? What, uh, what, uh, what do you use when you're reading and how do you uh, catch yourself from just reading the book as opposed to performing? it? Um, well, I use a tablet. So I download the manuscript as a PDF on a tablet paper. I just, for me, I would just make too much noise with paper um, so I have a tablet, I use an app called I annotate. And so I can use like a little Apple pencil or just like an off brand pencil. And I mark up the script just like, like Copperhead. What's your name? What's your name? Uh, What's your... Copper, Michael, Jack. Michael. Okay. Story. Cause it... <laughs> I don't know I, how to I, refer to you. Um... Her names at this point, ma'am. It's ridiculous. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. We're all right. Copperhead. Um, so I, um, just like you, I mark up the script. I highlight the dialogue depending on the character. So I know mm -hmm. that as soon as I hit, you know, the blue, I know that this is the main male character. Mm -hmm. As soon as I hit the purple, it's the main female character. So I don't have to stop and think about it. So I prep the script. I read the entire book beforehand, mark it up, make sure I have all the pronunciations I need to have, make sure I'm not missing anything. There aren't any errors in, because mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes there are errors in, in manuscripts. Doesn't matter how many editors look at it. I'm sure there's going to be an error. Um, so I make sure that you know, I know the story. And then doing that, me, when I sit down to narrate the book, um, connect to the story as a performer, as an actor, and connect emotionally to it. So I'm not thinking about who's talking here, um, mm -hmm. who, what accent is this here. Um, and I read a chapter, chapter at a time. Mm -hmm. um, because when you submit a book, you have to submit them chapters at a time. And I try to do about two hours finished audio a day, which takes me about an entire day to do. Um, and, and I just, I was successful, um, but I work really hard to just connect to every sentence, um, in an emotional way and think about the motivations of each character as they're saying things, as they're picking up this bottle, how is she feeling? And it's, 
it's a lot of mental work as I'm narrating a book. And the more I do it, the longer I've done it, the easier it gets. But that's, that's my process. Um, and one I'm sure I'm, it'll change. One thing I'm curious to is that, so um, the recordings I did recently, um, I actually had uh, Miss Tanya like sitting on the phone with me, listening the whole time because she knows what the authors are looking so for. I know she's, she's my angel. I, I love, love her. her. Yeah, my, me too. This she's my manager at this point, <laughs> so. and 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 she's also uh, because I've been working with her on on the book she's writing. She's also a very very talented uh, writer, and, and so mm -hmm. I, she uh, um, she submitted uh, you know her first chapter like just like hey will you read this and look over it? and I said absolutely and I just gave her some notes back and and yeah like as somebody who. Uh, you know, uh, see submissions, you know, for our publishing company and who uh, sees a lot of writing samples, you know, as is, is we're uh, working through uh, whether or not I'm going to edit someone's <laughs> book or, or work with them professionally like that. Uh, I was very surprised at how clean and, and really well written her, her first chapter was compared to how, you know, she, she presented it. And I was the same way whenever I, the first time I went to an industry professional and said, hey, can you tell me if this is absolute garbage or not? Um, that's not mm -hmm. how I phrased it, but that's what I was thinking in my head. And, and yeah, like I, she got the same experience for me. Uh, I hope that I got from that gentleman who was like, you know, based on how you were very, uh, you know, not super confident in what you'd written. I cannot believe that this, you know, is you uh, and you've never written any fiction before. You've never had a novel published. And it's like, no. So uh, in addition to all that, she's also a really great writer. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's always nice whenever that's what I like about, about TikTok so far, mm -hmm. uh, compared to the other, uh, social media is, is like, you know, I, I can be myself and be genuine on here, whether it's in my content here on the lives or whatever it is. And, uh, oh, apparently Angela, you are the reason that, uh, she's writing, uh, she's writing this book that I'm working on. Oh, so that's really, is that that's the really sleep fun. story? I told her one, one live, I told her to write me a sleep story that she, that I could narrate. Because she pops in when I live narrate, and she's like, you sound a bit tired today. <laughs> she tells me when I sound tired. Um, yep. But I told her one day to write me a sleep story so I could I could narrate it. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's where it came from. But anyway, sorry, continue. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a psychological thriller, so I'm not, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether that's <laughs> okay. or not. Uh, but, uh, but, but uh, let's see. But, but anyway, um, yes, the sleep story that turned into the crime scene. Oh, well, well there, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh but but yeah so so i we can be ourselves and be genuine and you know that's what this community wants and then you've got you know uh you know uh instagram it, it was it was interesting how uh the more i you know did uh stuff that was just not me uh i was getting rewarded for that and not for uh you know just doing what uh, what i wanted to do and and having good conversations and so, yeah. uh, you know, that, that's what happened with, with me and uh, Copperhead last week was, uh, you know, we were talking about how, you know, you have to have a lot of authenticity in whatever you're doing creatively. And, you know, that's what you should, that's what you should be rewarded for, not trying mm -hmm. to, uh, yes, this is such a welcoming community. Um, mm -hmm. Not, you know, even though we, even though a lot of us do like the lip, lip sync stuff and the short little funny videos on, on TikTok, um, you know, most people are also... Uh, genuinely discussing, uh, you know, the the problems they're having with their writing process, or you know how what struggles they're having, but they're also celebrating their wins uh, mm -hmm. when they win awards, when they when they finish drafts, when they get published, and like I know, I believe was it was it you, Angela? Didn't you uh, were you uh, the one who was finally able to announce the next book that you're narrating? Or uh... I think that was Paige. Oh, that Paige. was Paige. Yes. Yeah, Paige. Yeah, yeah so and, good. And, and, yeah, and so and so stuff like that. It's uh, you know that that's the kind of stuff that really gets this community going. Um, and uh, yeah, and and you know Tanya's right. Uh, there there isn't there isn't the gatekeeping. Um, and, and I know that you know with like Bookstagram, that was a lot of it was uh, unless you were you know talking about or doing content uh, about the really big books, um, you know you you weren't gonna get any views and nobody was gonna care. And TikTok mm -hmm. is kind of kind of the the opposite of that, which is which is really nice because I know that uh, you know whether or not you're 
independently published, traditionally published, whether or not you're a narrator on ACX or whether or not you're narrating for, you know, the big five books. Um, you know, it's on here. I love how it's about um, about the creativity and, and, and about, you know, the quality of the content, no matter where it's coming from. And, uh, you know, I don't know if, if you all agree with that, but I, I think that, uh, you know, that's what I'm always looking for when I want to discuss, you know, my art and, and what I'm doing creatively with other creative folks. So that's my little rant. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think even, even my, th this whole world of everything is very obviously new to me. And a lot of it comes from Tanya <laughs> through Tanya. Um, so like, <laughs> Angela can be a, a lot of my followers know that if they send me a little heart thing, I have to do this. <laughs> so, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> making the monkey, they're just making the monkey dad at this point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then if anybody puts up anything about Alabama, I, I can't say you roll. I cannot say. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so, and even everything that I've seen from the community so far, um, that I pretty much all get. Hey, Leah got ten thousand oh. words a few days ago. Good job. Sorry, I I want to give give her a oh, shout hey. out. That's uh, that's great. And, and you know, uh, ten thousand words is um, you know that's that's ten percent of a hundred thousand uh, word novel, which is what uh, mm -hmm. you know most most people who write novels for an adult audience. That's what you're trying to get to because then you're going to get an editor like me who's going to knock it down to 90,000 words and you're going to be exactly where you want to be. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, and so like, you know, getting, you know, the, those words to come and, you know, getting the pile on top of each other, uh, it definitely, it takes, uh, you know, being in and, and being rewarded for being in that creative space. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, that's whenever people talk about writer's block, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a block in your creativity and that can come from, um, uh, 34,000. All right. You're getting real close. Um, but, but to get those words to flow, yeah, you, you need, uh, you know, some positive reinforcements, um, uh, you know, to, to help you keep going and, and for writers, you know, cause we, um, you know, and you guys too, when you're, when you're working, you're literally in a, in a soundproof box, right? We're in our own little world when we're writing, um, that's where a community like this can really help. It can help to have people celebrate with you. Uh, it can help uh, other people who know your frustrations because that's something that uh, in, when you're in a in a very specific kind of kind of art like writing or or acting or voice acting, you know there are problems you deal with that only other people who do what you do understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I love I love my family, uh, but I just they don't know what it, what it is like to sit down and write a novel and. Uh, I can complain in general, but, you know, you, you go to another writer and you can talk very specifically about process, about, um, you know, the, the, the very technical craft things that you are working on and that you're struggling with. And it is so comforting to know that you're not the only one who's struggling with that. You're not the only one who has that kind of problem. Um, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, but and so was you trying to write something, mom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and like, you know, you have people who are like, oh, you know, uh, w w when do you think you can be done, you know, with your draft? And it's like, you know, I, I can have a schedule, but guess what? That's just going to get blown up. So uh, even if I tell you when, and then all of a sudden it's like you get a little anxiety. You're like, well, I don't want to promise you anything. You know, that's, uh, you know, that, that only works against me. Like, you know, sometimes deadlines are good, depending on what you're doing. If it's an editing deadline, revisions, um, yes, uh, I absolutely, you know, think that those those help me. Uh, keep me on task. But, you know, if it comes to getting the first draft done and getting the story told, um, you know, I don't like to give myself deadlines because all that does is put pressure on me and that can work, uh, that can work against me because, uh, and I, even if I try to write a thousand words a day, I have a friend, Andrew Brandt, uh, just put out a really, really great book and he does. He writes a thousand words a day and he stops, whether that takes him two hours, whether it takes him five. And I could not do that because there are some days where, uh, I have no idea what I'm going to write next, and I don't like to jump around and write scenes out of order if I can help it. And so there are some days where I wouldn't hit that goal. And then there are some days, like if I'm off work and I am in a good place and I can go somewhere and write, you know, I might be able to get three or four or 5,000, you know, if I'm able to write for all eight hours. And so I would not want to stop myself at one just because that is what I call my process. 
Now, mm-hmm. that being said, I do not write books as often and get them published as often as Andrew. Uh, so, you know, there are there are some drawbacks. So, um, but, it, but it's, it's all about... it's not a competition. Like, it's not a competition. Yes. I feel like it's... You, you have to give yourself that grace to take those breaks. Because even as a narrator, there are some days I get in the booth and I start reading and I'm just like, oh, this is just not working for me. <laughs> I'm not feeling it. I'm tired. I'm stumbling. You know, par- mm-hmm. like a page that would normally take me a few minutes is taking me 15 minutes. And it's just, mm-hmm. you know, you have to know your limits and you have to know when to just step away and give yourself a bit of a break. I think any creative profession. Yes, Tanya has to remind me of that on a constant basis because I'm a stubborn Irish Cajun and I'll just be like, <laughs> oh, power through it. I'm going to keep going. I got this. And she- <laughs> there are times where Tanya literally has to be big mama and be like, honey, you need a nap. And I'll be like, no, the hell I don't. I got this. I'm going to do this. She'll be like, honey, take a break. Mm. Go take a nap. Fine. I'm taking a nap because right. I want <laughs> And But yeah, we yeah. use one of those things where you, and it's hard because you, especially when you do something, I actually did a live earlier today where I talked about this. Mm. When you are passionate about something, it is very hard to put it aside, set it down, or take a break because you, you want to, and you not only want to, but when there's something that you're passionate about that not only a, you share with other people, but you share with other people and affects other people. You want to put it down even less Yes, because it's a thing where I personally for myself down, but there's people who enjoy what I do. And I can't let them down. I don't want to do that to them. But there is that side of it where it's like, listen, yes, that's right. You're you're right. I get it. But if you really want to give them that best part of you, you need to take a second. You need to dial it back. You need to get yourself good. And I part of it's also coming from a military background where it's where that's this kind of comes from, where it's like, I'm sorry. If I'm missing one leg and you tell me get up the hill, all right, I'm a hobble up the hill because it needs mm-hmm. to get done. To take care of my boys, but I'm a hobble up the hill. <laughs> um, so when it comes down to other things, oftentimes I kind of need some people sometime to kind of ring me in and be like, "Hey, honey, you're doing great. Take a second, stop Get yourself. Yep, it'll make you better. It'll make you better yep. in the long run. And it's hard because I know I'm I'm the same as you, and I get mad at myself. Which mm-hmm. makes it worse because I get so mad that I'm not performing or I'm not like looking at or going, What's wrong with you? What's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you got to forgive yourself, you got to give yourself that grace. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're not going to progress. For, for me, it was really, um, you know, I, I had all the time in the world to write, you know, during the pandemic. And so, you know, I, I was, you know, I, I, I treated it like a job, you know, eight hours a day up there writing. And um, you know, I had, I, I was able to write two books. Both of them were published in 2021. Uh, one of them was just, you know, me and my publisher had to work so hard to get it into a place where we could publish it and we could, um, you know, meet our contractual obligations and we could finish up, you know, we wanted it to be, it was a sequel to a story I'd written. And so we were able to tie things up well, uh, but it, mm-hmm. it took a lot of work. And then, you know, the other one, after I got done, you know, writing that one, um, I said, okay, obviously I need to do a little better job of making sure that I'm writing when I should be writing. Uh, because, you know, the first one, the, I was at the very beginning of the pandemic when the entire world was falling apart. And, you know, I don't know if, if it affected you, Angela, being in the news business before, but, you know, the, the constant, you know, like, you know, journalists are terrible people message that was being put out in the world, you know, it affected me personally. And I'm like, no, that's not true. And I'm not, you know, do you know, our, you know, and yes, the media messes up, but I mean, it was just like, I, you know, my entire brain was just like hearing nothing but these awful things. And so I should not have been writing. Uh, and, and so I got past that. And then, you know, six months later, you know, you're kind of used to the new normal. And then I wrote that book very quickly. And that one, you know, has recently won an award. It's been nominated for a few others. People have really enjoyed it. And so um, yeah, I'm able to look back at that and go, yeah, the, the headspace I'm in and what I'm, what I'm going through in real life, it affects the writing. So, um, you know, I'm glad that I don't have, uh, any more contracts that I'm writing under. I mean, 
you know, it would be great to be guaranteed to be published again. And that's why you work to get two book deals and always keep doing that. But at the same time, I'm kind of glad I got to step back, reassess, you know, who I am as a writer, what I'm doing with my creativity. And now I'm moving forward with a different plan and I have different goals that I'm going to work toward. And I know what to expect as I'm chasing them. And, uh, and, and yeah, so Tanya, like, you know, Divided States was the book that, uh, that she read and uh, we didn't know each other then, which, you know, every time somebody says that, I read your book and I loved it. And I don't know them personally. I'm like, somebody I don't know read my work. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm panicking, but they tell me they like it and then it kind of goes away. And so, uh, no, heart, <laughs> love those. Um, but, but that is, uh, uh, yes, that was, the, that was the second book I wrote after I figured that out. And after uh, I, I, I finally embraced, you know, having all this time and, it, you know, I was able to shut out all the all the terrible stuff that was that was going on i finally felt uh, i developed the coping mechanism for that and so um you know i feel much better about how i'm moving forward and i do forgive myself for not putting down as many words as i want knowing that i can do it i've done it four times before you know so i just uh knowing that i can do it is also a big thing like uh did you guys feel that at all after you got done with your first major uh maybe not even a book narration but voice acting project, uh, if you will, uh, knowing, okay, I can do this. And you felt more confident going into the next one. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you listen, I'm <laughs> I'll start calling on people if you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm still waiting for my big breakout one. I'm, I'm at the beginning of that whole process. So you ma'am, can speak on that one all you want. I ain't done nothing major yet. Yet. Soon. Getting there. Yet. yet. Soon. I promise you soon. Um, yes, right. Manifest. Um, I My left, hold on it's somewhere in here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when I when I did my first book, um, I, it wasn't that long ago either. Um, I it was hard. It was really tough to get through that first book, and it just and every book following that it's just gotten easier easier and easier it's still mm -hmm. a tough process but you get more comfortable with the process yeah. and with what you need to give yourself to prepare to dig into the process and get a book finished so it gets right. you know you do it faster and you do it better and the performances are more connected and you know i feel like with every project i do i get better and better and that's okay. i think that's the same thing as a, as a writer right mm -hmm. i mean you look right. at past books that you've done and you think, oh, I could, yeah. I could, just, I could do if I'd only done that yeah. with that character, right? I mm. have yet to meet a writer who's, uh, who says, yes, uh, you know, I definitely go back and, and you know, read, read my first book. You should definitely do that. No. I mean, usually <laughs> what they say is I would love it if you bought it and don't feel obligated to read it because, uh, you know, that was, you know, I did not know all the things that I know now. And uh, mm -hmm. in fact, Har Harlan Coben, who, you know, who, you know, is, uh, you know, been on the New York Times bestseller, bestseller list, you know, more than I, years I've been alive, probably. Um, he released his first book and he released the unedited, ver not unedited, but the first version that was published before a larger publisher bought it and they reworked it and, and reissued it. And he did it and he wrote a forward to the front, a letter um, that said, so this is the original publication um that most of you have never read because it was a small press like the ones i write for and he said uh i'm putting this out so that writers can see uh you know what that first book can look like versus what i write like now so he said if this is your first experience reading my work put this book down set it aside go pick up something new that i've written read that and then come back and read this and that was that was part mm. of the experiment um and, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I, I'm in a uh, critique group with, uh, through the International Thriller Writers. I actually host the critique group because apparently I'm an online TV host now. And so uh, they, uh, you know, I, I host the critique group. And one of the things that I really liked about the last uh, experiment, or not experiment, that's somebody, what the last submission I sent in was that they uh, said that I, I, I'm really able to bring the setting and the characters uh, to life for them uh, very vividly, even though I'm not taking two pages to describe what they look like and that sort of thing. And that is something that you work on as a writer. It's a craft thing. You work on, you know, using little specific details to really paint the picture uh, along with the dialogue and, and everything else. And so to get that compliment from another group of writers, 
saying, you know, you are really able to do that and I love reading it. That is a huge compliment for me because, yeah, that's been several years in the making of me being able to do that because mm-hmm. that used to be my weak point. You know, I was good at dialogue, you know, plot, yes, uh, you know, interesting characters, gotcha. But it was it was the description and it was making it vivid without, you know, dumping a bunch of uh, dumping a bunch of description or just not describing things and people aren't sure you know, what the building looks like or what the character looks like. So finding that middle balance and knowing that the, I worked on that and it is finally something that I'm just doing because they're reading the first draft. That's what a critique group is. Um, you know, that that's wonderful. And so I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, do, do voice, uh, do voice actors, Angela, do you guys uh, send uh, samples of what you do into each other? Do you have any kind of critique group infrastructure like writers do? Um, I have, yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are some online, online courses that have like Facebook groups, but I have, um, I have accountability partners. I have a few mm. of them and they are like, oh my Hold God, on. they're God's bill of buddies. Do you, do you have some, do you have? No, no, I'm asking the way you said accountability partners. I'm like, wait a minute. So you legitimately have accountability buddies. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Legitimately. Like they are that my is- best friends. They're my best friends. We are. Yeah. I mean, because it's hard, right? Like this industry, it's a beautiful thing. So it's great because the community is so welcoming and warm and all about professional development and personal development. But at the same time, it's really isolating. You're in a room by yourself working on your craft for hours and hours working on, you know, a hundred thousand word books Mm -hmm. and um, having people who, are you can bounce ideas off of, or you can say like, listen to my sample. Like, does this sound, how does this sound? Does it sound like me? Is it, how are the voices? And, um, and, and even just to talk about who you're reaching out to and what publishers you're working with and how you should approach a certain situation. Like all of these things are so important in this, in this field that we're in. And it's such, it's a creative field. So yes, I have a number of people who I speak with multiple multiple times a day and we are constantly (laughs) voice messaging each other and sending things to each other and some days are really rough like some days are so rough so Mm. you know when you're when we're having those rough days because it's it's going back to talking about listening to your own voice and how we are such we are so hard on ourselves I am so hard on myself and I you know there are days where I'm like I just can't do this I am I'm terrible I don't know and everything is a fluke. The imposter syndrome is real. And those people. Oh my God, I've actually done. never heard it called that, but yes, that, that is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, Almost, you look back at what the, you, I can't even say that it's, I, I can't even say that it's like five minutes ago. I can't even say that it's like the, what you did last year, but yeah, the imposter syndrome is real because you're like, oh, yeah. no, that, no, that's a different dude. No, right. like do it, but this dude can't do it. It's like, uh, homie. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. I, it just happened by accident, yeah. but it's never going to happen again. It's yeah, like like writers, you know, imposter syndrome is a joke that we just that we just have, and for a lot of us, you know, it, it's part of the process. You know, you just have to you have to feel like you're a fraud, and that what you're writing is absolute <laughs> garbage, and uh, and you have to working past that is actually what gets you um, to the end to the end of your book. And, you know, it's funny, I, can, I've, I was in a, a live critique group before COVID kind of busted it all up, um, where, you know, these were uh, two people who'd been on the New York Times bestseller list several times in the women's fiction and romance, uh, and then an, another guy who uh, hasn't hit the list yet, but, you know, they print uh, hundreds of thousands of copies of his book whenever he writes one. And every time, you know, they were just like, you know, I just, you know, this, t- was this chapter absolute, you know, what's going on? I need, I need your help. And I'm sitting there going, you, you need our help. Like, what do you, you know, like I'm contributing to this group. What are you even talking about? They're like, you, you've written four novels and two of them have won awards and been nominated for other stuff. Like you, you know, we want you here. And it's like, I can't believe that you all want me here, but all right, let's do this. Um, and, and so, yeah, when a group of writers get together, it's it's one big you know the you know congratulating each other on everything that's happening and the writers going yeah but you know and and it's, right. it's it, it, there's always it's, always that feeling on, and it, it's on. an objective observer would be like you guys are morons you're you know I love all your books and will you please shut up and quit you know 
it, it feels like we're fishing for compliments, but it's like, no, we all legitimately, we've done it four times, we've done it 40 times, but we're just, you know, not sure if we can do it this next time. And then you get to the point where you realize, oh, wait, I have done this several times before. I know I can do this. Let's go. And you just, once you get over mm-hmm. that is when you can really motor through and finally finish your project. Well, I feel like mm-hmm. when, I was in, when I was in radio, so I'm, I worked for the public broadcaster in Canada. I live in Canada. Um, mm-hmm. And sort of the Canadian version. Well, hold on. What part, eh? Pardon me? What, what, what part? part? Well, uh, Toronto. Toronto. Okay. I was, you're a Quebecois? No. <laughs> are you going <laughs> to okay. speak a Quebecois accent? Let me see. Let me hear. Uh, no, so I tell you one thing there is that uh, Canada, I don't know all that well. I'm going to be perfectly what honest. <laughs> so Canada, I know all that well. The only parts of Canada that I really know is uh, Newfoundland because, uh, you know, I got family up there. And then Nova <laughs> Scotia, got, uh, you know, the Acadians in my family who sort of hang about up there. Um, but other than that, no, I don't know Quebecois very well. But when you said Canada earlier, I was like, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I, was like, I mean, I, I know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm from Toronto, so we basically sound like Americans, I think for the most part. Um, want to, but haven't been yet. The only, the only time I spent in Canada was on military mission, oddly enough, up in Newfoundland. Yeah. Oh, okay. Were you, New, like New Brunswick, New Brunswick. Okay. All right. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Out there. We weren't in. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so so I work for the public broadcaster here as as a newscaster, national newscaster, and and the uh, philosophy that some of us had was you're only as good as your last newscast. So it doesn't matter, you're a national newscaster, but mm-hmm. you know if you me- and you mess up, right? I mean, you have four minutes mm-hmm. and twenty seconds live on air to read a newscast. You're going to stumble. Sometimes you're going to stumble really badly, and. Mm-hmm. You get out of there and really you feel that you're only as good as your last newscast, which isn't very good a lot of the time. So I think as a creative, when you're writing things, it's like if you don't get those pages done, if you don't get that narration done, you feel it feels the same way. So 100 percent. That's, that's a great but, way to put it. But the thing that keeps me going, I'll tell you, because I, I have a lot of those days. I'm just like, well, what's the option? What's the option? Are you going to quit? Are you going to quit writing? <laughs> Are you going to quit narrating, Copperhead? I mean, you're not going to quit, right? You can't. Oh, well, first off, mm-hmm. I just started. And wow. uh, said, so much don't time. quit, which means that I don't quit because I'm sorry. My mama, it's, oh, sorry, not to get off track. My mama is on here on TikTok. None of y'all know her name because otherwise y'all going to put my mama uh, my followers right now. But my mama is on TikTok. It, listen, if Tanya is my manager and my big sis and my angel and everything else, my mama is my business partner because my mama saw how much TikTok blew up and she wasn't like, oh, that's nice. She was like, OK, so if you ever want to do the T-shirts, I would probably recommend doing this. If you ever want to do the merch, we're going to do this. I actually bought a domain name for you. Um, it's only $40 for the year. So I already have two domain names for you. And I'm sitting there going, ah, what? Okay, what? <laughs> what? And she's just so supportive of me. Uh, but um, but yeah, sorry, not to get off topic. But yeah, it's kind of one of those things where it's like she and I've expressed this to her, where I'm like, hey, you know what, Mama? I, I, why? Like why? And I kind of talked about this in my live earlier. Part of it has to do, and I don't know, Miss Angela, if you've experienced this, you're kind of like personal things in your life. But like I was a theater kid. I was the, I'm the funny guy unit and it's brought me some of my closest friends in the world. It has brought me some of the most beautiful people in the world. That being said, and pardon my language, when you get told, shut the fuck up, no one cares for long enough, you start to kind of feel that. Yeah. Since that this blew up, like I still have not had the, Holy crap moment. I mean, even earlier today, I've hit either just over 500K something followers. I have not hit that holy crap moment because I'm still in shock because there's still that moment of like, well, hold on. Hold on. I could still mess this up. So <laughs> I have to keep doing this. I have to keep, there, there's no stopping. And because no matter what you do, it's always one of those things where, like you just said, 
you're as good as your last broadcast, where you're always worried that, hey, if I slip up one little bit, if like if a sentence is off, if, you know, from a writing standpoint, if a chapter is off, something like that, it's gone. It's done. And it's hard because it's like you that's not going to topple the whole tower. And does that make you work that much harder? Yes. But it kind of goes into what you were saying earlier, where it's like, there are those times where you need to dial yourself back because it's like, you know, Hey, you're passionate. You got this. It's fine. Take a second. Because if you just keep going and going and going and going and going, you're going to collapse. And Mm -hmm. then, literally going to bring about the self-fulfilling prophecy that you are worried about. Yep. So, and that's another thing that I've loved about this community is that since uh, I'm still very new to the whole voice actor, author, everything community. And, and it, it's one of those things that like, I have not gotten in here and everyone was like, Oh, so uh, what are you doing here? What, uh, what do you do? It's one of those things where everyone's like, oh, you do this? Oh, dude, that's sweet. So, like, this guy does this, and this guy does this, and this guy. And it's so welcoming. And it's yeah. it's just amazing beyond words. Uh, Beautiful. It, it's my words. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's you're talking about that. Like, what do you do? What do you do? It's like, yeah, I'm sitting here, you know, hosting, uh, you know, a live event, which I didn't even know what on earth that was a couple of years ago. And I had never done that <laughs> until, like, six months ago when I was doing it through work on Zoom. And, you know, now, you know, we have, you know, I'm talking with a couple of audio book narrators and voice actors. And, you know, it's it's incredible that this is happening right now because if, if you know, anyone who knew me a few months ago had uh, said that I was going to be doing this, I would be like, mm, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I and, if anyone yeah. who knew me months ago told me I would be doing yeah. this, I'd say that I. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. No. And, and so but it's, you know, the the, the community and, and you're talking about, you know, how everyone is very cool. It's the, the writing community uh, in, in general. Uh, you know, it, I have yet to meet an author who did not want to offer assistance if they could. And, um, you know, you're talking about having to take a step back. I'm, you know, to the point now where I actually have to um, say I'm not going to be able to commit that time right now to to do this thing for you, but I almost always know somebody who will, will be able to, and who like, uh, I had someone who wanted uh, me to blurb their book. Right. And I'm like, you know, I just, I'm having trouble writing my own plus, you know, uh, work's picking up. So I don't think I can commit that kind of time, but my friend, Andrew, he just got done with the book. So he's in a little bit of a, you know, uh, he, a little bit of a post, you know, uh, project, not low, but you know, he's taking a little break. And your book is actually one that he would really enjoy anyway. So I sent the, you know, and then, you know, that worked out great. And, uh, but that's how the writing community works. And really the entire creative community here on TikTok has, has really seemed to be that way. Whereas, you know, you talk about other, other social medias. Yeah. You, you, you comment, you know, on someone who's celebrating something or, or even just, you know, if you think that, you know, their next book looks cool and it's automatically like, Oh, I don't know you. Are you trying to uh, sell me something? You know, what is your purpose here? You know, whereas on, on book talk, it's like, yeah, we're all kind of selling our own stuff, but we're also, uh, we just want somewhere to talk with other like-minded people. And, you know, you guys aren't going to understand all the writing stuff. I'm not going to understand, you know, what it's like to perform a book, but we can still talk about, you know, uh, achieving our goals and the creative process and how it, it takes, um, a community to do that because even though everybody thinks about being a writer uh, because this is the way it's represented on TV is they're in their room and they, they go into the cabin and they don't come out until they're either, you know, uh, certifiably insane or they have a book, right? Like that's, that's not how it works. You step out of that. You have to go have coffee with your author friends. You have to, you know, uh, you know, talk to people on your social media. You have to go to writers conferences, you know, like they're probably, six of them throughout the year that I have the same group of friends that we all go to the same conferences if we're able to make that trip. And, you know, that gives us, uh, you know, a boost of energy to go finish our projects because we all get together and go, oh, yeah, you know, we're, we're writers. That's right. That is what we do. And so why don't we go do it now? 
but you have to take that little break and re-energize. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's beautiful. Like I think it's the fact that we're celebrating each other. Mm. Like, Right. I mean, I just, I love it. And specifically with the narrator community, because that's, that's, that's who I interact with a lot and, and the book community. But I mean, I celebrate other female narrators who are probably my competition, but I just feel so excited for the successes of everyone in this industry, because, because I think, I don't think you can be doing what we're doing right now um, without really loving what you do. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the amount of focus and work that it takes and to see other people doing those same things and succeeding and achieving those things. Like, I think it's, sometimes I feel like people think maybe I'm being disingenuous, but I just, I genuinely feel so happy when I see. Other well, it's people. almost like an underground art kind of community. It's almost a very underground. Really? Like, you mean you, you walk up and down Hollywood Boulevard, you're going to see about, a hundred actors who almost made it and almost this and almost that you go down, you know, Broadway in New York and you're going to see about a hundred to not more of people trying to get in the theater and musical and stuff like that who almost made it. But within those communities, you're also going to find people who do one of two things. They tear each other down because it's so cutthroat or they build each other up because they're all going through the same thing. Um, like uh, John, who I live with, um, is a dance teacher. Um, and in the big city of where we are, he recalls how in like the 80s and 90s, it was like, if you were a dance teacher, if you were an actor, if you were an artist, if you were this, if you were that, everybody came in and supported each other because it was very much this the shared thing of, you know, we're all going through stupid crap. We're all going through things that we love to do and we're striving for that next thing. And they all want to support each other in that endeavor, not knock each other down, not do this, not do that, because there's that sense of, I have been where you are and I only got to where I am because someone pulled me from you. So you want to be the person that pulled someone out for you. And starting in this community, I have been, I'm still beside myself from the amount of people who are like, hey, you're starting, cool. I suggest this, I will help you with this, I will help you with that. Because for me, it's almost kind of like receiving it on the other end of it in the army. In the army, you know, when I see these new kids come in, I see these kids who, as an NCO, as a non-commissioned officer, like, I don't look at them as these dumb kids who blah, blah, blah. I see them as, no, I was you. And I want to give you absolutely everything that I have learned. I want you to not, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be better than me. And you build and you build and you build. And that's the only way that you create such a beautiful community that we have. And even when the community is in tatters, like the army right now, um, <laughs> the only way that you're going to fix it is to be that, to be that change. And I've, I've, I've been so beside myself and happy to see that in this community, that that is the mentality is, Oh, you're new. Come on in. We have plenty of people willing to help. Yes. You know, we yeah. people build you up. We have plenty. What do you do? What's your niche? Dude, that's cool. All right, cool. Awesome. This direction. Rather than, hey, mm. cool. Are you an alcoholic yet? No. <laughs> All right, you will be. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Oh. Well, Rick, when... I mean, you probably experienced this. Like, you're, you were a journalist. Like, coming from journalism, I don't know how it is down there. But up here, it is not a friendly place to live, right? Like, jour- like journalism is, you know, I've, I've met some great people. But on the whole, uh, for me, it was a very toxic place to be. The That's competition, what I was about to say. Right? Okay. So, like, yeah. go ahead. Say it. Cause- well, yeah. Like, you just, you know, the, uh, you know, just the industry as a whole, 
uh, just, yeah, it was toxic work environments and you're always competing with the, you know, the other news organization. And then, you know, I, you know, I'm, thir- I'm th- about to be 37. So I saw the very end of, you know, newspapers whenever they were just starting to get their websites up and figuring all that out to whenever anybody could start a blog and all of a sudden be your competition because, you know, most of your money and you were trying to get stuff, you know, out on the digital side first. And, you know, that transformation, you know, it just, uh, and, and there was no money. And like, even I, I was the managing editor of the Amarillo Globe News, you know, my hometown paper um, that I came back, you know, to work at after going to school at UT. And, um, you know, I ended up the managing editor basically through attrition because I was one of the last people to hang on. And then we got bought out by uh, uh, Gatehouse, which became Gannett and, you know, all that stuff happening at the top. I got headhunted by a smaller but very good paper down down near Austin where I went to college and the people were great, but I was still there, you know, I was trying to get professional people to work for 12 and a half dollars an hour. And I said, you know, no, that's because even if I got somebody great and they came in, you know, they were, were they ever going to get a raise? No, probably not. And it, it just, that kind of stuff turns a workplace toxic. And so what, what Michael was saying earlier about people constantly telling you, no, shut the fuck up. No, shut the fuck up. That is what it's like to work in a newsroom every day, especially yeah. when you, Especially whenever you are in a ma- in a, in an editing position where you know you you get past all the angry calls, you get passed up the chain to you, um, and so like yeah, I hear that every day for years on end. It just it doesn't matter what kind of person you were going in, you're a different person coming out, and so that's you know the creative community is such the opposite it has been, and so uh, you know I'm so much happier now than I ever was. Uh, and I love journalism, still do. I, I binge watch shows and watch journalism movies. And I, you know, it hurts my heart that I'm not in it anymore. But on a day to day basis, I would never go back. And, uh, and, and you, you were talking, uh, Michael, about, uh, you know, everybody wanted to bring himself uh, up along. Um, you know, that used to happen in journalism, but it stopped because everybody, they didn't want anybody new to join the team because that might mean you get fired later if you were making more mm-hmm. money, right? Like everybody was your competition. <clears throat> but whenever I joined that critique group that I was talking about, you know, the in-person with, you know, the, the, the writers who like have some major credentials, uh, you know, you kind of audition to get into the group, right? You have to go in. Um, read a chapter and critique everybody else's to see if it's going to be a good fit, see if you're going to contribute and, and that kind of thing. And what they told me at the end, they said, okay, you're in. Oh, good night. Uh, that was kind of cool. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> That was cool, wasn't it? <laughs> it was like, but, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, right. But what, what they said was, okay, but in order to get in, there's one last thing you have to, you have to promise, and that is that you are going to find somebody uh, who, who needs to need your help and you're going to bring them up along with you because that's what we're going to try to do with you and you need to do that for other writers and that was a condition if i was not willing to do that i couldn't be in in the critique group and and benefit from their knowledge and all that stuff and so like that was and this was like formal in that yeah we met at the same time and place every week but it, it was not like you know this was just a group of writers who said we're going to make this the rule that we're all going to help each other uh and we're going to find other people and help them along too, because that is just how this is going to work. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't believe that. I was like, you know, this is, I felt like I was joining this amazing club where the entire goal was for everybody to be as awesome as they could. And it was, you know, like uh, absolutely one of the coolest feelings um, I've ever had, you know, as a, as a professional, right. Because, you know, I, you know, it is one of the things that I do to make a living is, is writing novels. Mm-hmm. So, that was uh, that was pretty awesome. So I thought that fit in really well with what you were talking about earlier. Are you a Star Wars fan at all? Uh, I am not. I'm a Star Trek oh. fan. Uh, but oh, yeah, it's Star. Uh, I watched the original trilogy, but not any of the other stuff. Okay, so in one new one, it's funny because I'm not a huge Star Wars guy, um, but there is this one scene where essentially you've got old Luke Skywalker talking to I think the ghost of Yoda. And they're talking about Ren, and he talks about that they surpass us. The greatest burden of masters is. It's the idea that when when you become a master of your craft, that the greatest burden that you will ever have to bear is watching your 
your charge, your squire, your your student that you built up be better than you. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because, again, in one of the greatest communities I've ever been in, at least in the military, that is the idea. You know, all of my sergeants, and I never understood why. I never understood why. They were like, you're going to be better than me. And as a little private, I'm like, sorry, I ain't never going to be better than you. Mm-hmm. And granted, I still don't think I am. But even like some of my kids, I don't refer to them as my soldiers. I refer to them as my kids because they're like my kids. They, they are surpassing me of where I was when I was their age. And that is the only way that you continue to make things better and better and better. And that's, again, what I've seen in this community. And even what you were talking about is that no one has this mentality of like, listen, I'm as good as it gets. <laughs> Be good as me. You know, there's this mentality of like, here's everything that I've done. I started here. I see you starting and I want you to, to succeed. And I want you, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be better than me. And it's, it, it warms my heart to no end. And it's just, it, I'm not crying. You're crying. Shut up. (laughs) Um, And it's, and it's just amazing, and it, it the, there's very few places. Oddly enough, as 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 opposite as people think they are, there's only two places in the world I've ever found that: the military and the artist community. Mm-hmm. As far as creativity, there's only two places in the world I've ever found that. Everywhere else, it's you're the new guy. I don't have to be nice to you because no one was nice to me. I don't have to build you up because no one built me up. But the only two places in this world I have ever found that leave this world better than it was when you found it is the military and the artist community. And it's it's amazing because that, that's how we have the things that we have. You know, if, if we look back at if we look back at what everything from authors, screenwriters, actors, um, everything like that. If we just, if we looked at it and we looked back and if all of them had said, listen, I'm the best that there is, you can't do any better than me. We would have none of the things that we do now. We would have none of the amazing authors, the amazing actors, the amazing writers, the amazing voice narrators, the amazing anything that we have now. And I think the reason why is that so many people are afraid to become obsolete and yeah. so many people are afraid to yeah well i'm old now i'm not the coolest thing ever and i think what again what i love about this community is that you know even you look back at some of the older authors and stuff like that and no one goes oh yeah they're old hat now they're like uh no them's the ogs like yeah. Those are the dudes we look up to. And even within the Army, it's the same thing. Like a lot of my sergeants who, you know, they were in basic training when 9-11 happened. You know, no one looks at them and goes, oh, man, doesn't know anything. We're like, "Uh, no, dude, Uh, that dude is the coolest out of everyone here. So everybody chill out. (laughs) So, um, but I've loved that about this community. And it really, it really goes to show me that, um, that I could not be more blessed that I have started to be brought into this community because it is really one of those things where as far as I want to take this, I have people who, which is far, um, (laughs) but as far as I want to take this, I have people who not only help me build that, Mm -hmm. but it's already one of those things where, you know, do you have competition? Of course you do. You always have competition. Uh Yeah. But there are always going to be people around me who are like, bro, where are you struggling? I got it. Here's my tips. Here's my tricks. Yeah. Here's my. And, well, it, and it, art it, is not a zero sum game, it is, is, you know, kind of, you know, the, the, the quick way to, to put that. And, you know, so many things are journalism, zero sum game. You either get the story, <laughs> you don't, you either beat the competition or you don't. 
and yeah. you're either you're either the reporter who can get the story or you can't and and you know that's that's the world you live in in art you know if, mm-hmm. if somebody likes a certain type of story or a certain author then they're usually willing to uh you know read the the person who uh oh if you like this author you're gonna love this or if you like this kind of story you're gonna like this people like to consume all of that and um so it's you know there is no no direct competition there and uh, also you know there's the you know good artists copy and great artists steal uh you know the, the reason that that is you know a saying and that, that people um you know repeat that is because uh yes whenever people find an art that they like they absolutely want to find more of it because they they enjoy it and they want as much of it in their life as they can get and uh, I know, you know, as, as a consumer uh, of books, that is absolutely how I feel. I'm always, you know, ready to find a new author who has a different take on this, you know, kind of story that I like. And that is why I think artists, they are not as afraid to see somebody else, you know, uh, shoot up to the top because they know that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, rising tide lifts all of our artistic boats. Uh, mm-hmm. So Kelly, you're you're late. Where we are discussing books <laughs> and ph- and philosophy and uh, uh, books, what, what, philosophy, voice narrating. Yeah. Basically, we're we're discussing uh, the creative community right now. We're discussing the creative community and how everybody likes to build each other up rather than tear each other down. And how in the world, in the state that it's in right now, you know that is an escape. I think that's one one reason that I have enjoyed uh, this, this uh, social media app and this community so much mm-hmm. here on TikTok is uh, yes, uh, the, it is because it's an escape from all the crap that's going on outside. And, you know, we, we get to see the things we like, you know, if you uh, engage with a uh, book and, and art stuff on, on TikTok, then that is what you're going to see. And, you know, you form your own community. Uh, whereas if you go and you just want to, you know, watch something on TV, who knows what on earth is going to be uh, put at you in the commercials or, or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of people, I, I spend too much time on the app rather than writing and I know it. <laughs> and, uh, and I think all, all writers probably do that. Now for people who do what you two do, um, it's, uh, I think a little different because uh, especially, you know, for, for Michael, like, you know, it's uh, helping lead to, opportunities because you know you're getting to showcase your voice and every time you um you know do a new accent on here you can see all the comments are just like oh my goodness you know that was so smooth how does he do it and all that stuff and i'm sure it's the same for you angela but uh if only i could talk and tell my story into the app and then have the app just produce my manuscript that would be that would be great and i know that dictation is a thing but uh you know here's an here's an interesting thing about a writer i suppose uh, as opposed to, um, you know, a voice actor. And you can tell me if there's anything that, um, you know, is kind of the same for you guys. But I have tried dictation and it is not the same. I am a tactile writer in that I think through, I think through my hands, I think through my fingertips and it, I can't handwrite. Uh, it has to be typing because I've been doing that since, uh, you know, uh, elementary schools. And I think when they started teaching us, you know, how to, how to use a keyboard. And so, like, that is how I think. I think through that process of whatever, you know, coming from here to here. And so, uh, you know, I cannot dictate a book. I could probably dictate, like, a synopsis of a story, like, get down, I think this will happen and this will happen. What if this happens? And, oh, cool, maybe that happens. But that's just like a workshop session. You can't, you know, you can't take that and turn it into a cohesive narrative. Uh, So I very much have to be at a computer and have to be typing in order for that process to happen. Um, uh, what about for you guys, would it be the same, whether or not you're kind of talking, um, you know, into a screen or into a microphone, like what sort of things, what sort of tools and mechanisms have to be different for you to be able to, uh, give a voice performance as opposed to just doing something like this? Hey, Copperhead, you do it from your car. How do you? I'm mean, curious about you. I mean, yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, that's right true. now, I mean, you're doing you're doing a lot from your car. I know not all of it because you're going to be doing audiobooks in no time. But yeah, like, how do you prepare your space? Because it still takes focus to do oh, that. Pa- Paige is waving at us. Hey, Paige. <laughs> okay, how are you, ma'am? Um, I think the. Oh, by the way, Molly, 
you and I need to be friends because I saw the comments while Rick was talking and I wasn't going to, um, I wasn't going to interrupt Rick, but Molly sounds like an OG. So we're going, we're going. Amazing. Molly's incredible. But, Talk to Molly. Cause I think she's looking for Molly. You're looking for, for a voice like Copperhead. I think I heard you talking on a live the other day. So oh, yeah, we, Molly's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, that just means that we got even more reason to talk. All accountability right, buddies. Account. What did you call it? Accountability. Yeah. Accountability. <laughs> what did you say? Accountability buddies. Accountability. Buddies. accountability. I, I, I used to say I will never understand why I started to sound like Sling Blade whenever I like joke. About it. Honestly, it comes from my dad. My dad is an old New England Irish Catholic, and every time he talks about something, he goes like this. So. He's always spoken like that, so uh, I suppose that's my version of it. Anyway, so as far as like getting in the headspace of it, mm -hmm. the big thing for me, especially because when I do videos that are centered towards a reaction to somebody, the headspace that I get in is that I... It, and I guess that the, the plus side of it is that because in my car, like, it's in the past... It's in the passenger seat. Right. So and be sitting there. A lot of times when I react. To me, it's like if I were to be looking at this person right now, everything's blocked off. Everybody else can part my language. Everyone else can fuck off. I'm talking to you. And I, here's what I want you to hear. And I want you to know that everything's going to be fine. And I want you to know that you are perfect the way you are. Right. And that absolutely nothing wrong with you and that you are absolutely perfect the way you are. And do not let anybody change your tune to match the melody of their music. Do not let anybody dull your shine because they think it looks better. Do not let anyone do this or that. That's the headspace I bring myself into is it's not, hey, do I sound good? Hey, to this, hey, to that. It's if I were to be talking to this person directly in front of me right now, what would I be telling them? Yeah. And with story, right? With, with even some of the narration, it, it's kind of the same thing. And all enough, Tanya, Tanya was who really helped me get there because for me, I would read something and she built and she'd be like, you're reading, you're not telling. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, when you tell me stories of things that have happened in your life, that's what I need to hear that's what we're looking for. And obviously you can't do the own, obviously you can't use your own words in it. But for me, what's really helped is that it's, it's the idea of you're telling the story. You're not just reading the page. You're not reciting. You're not Siri. You're not whatever the MS DOS voice thing was. I forget his name, but no one cares. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you are you are essentially becoming the voice of this person telling the story. Yep. And essentially, it's the looking from outwards in. But it's also looking from the in outwards. If you were to directly be telling the story to somebody, how would you tell it? If you were to, would you sit there and just be monotone and this and this and that the whole time? Or would you actually be expressive about it? How would you... How would you describe this to somebody? And you're basically taking that sort of emotion and that feeling, and you're now putting it in the context of what are the words in front of you? And actually, Miss Angela, I had a question for you. Do you find do you find it's a lot easier to narrate something that the whole story is first person because it's from a character that you can kind of be in while you're telling it? Because that was another thing that I've kind of talked to about with Tanya, that um, one of the readings I did recently as like a sample, which is now on ACX, mm. for me was so much easier because it's from first person. I can right. be that while I'm narrating, while I'm reading versus when it's in third person, you're almost in this weird kind of middle space where it's like, okay, well, who am I telling who am I telling the story to? Who am I? Well, I'm telling the story. Who is this? This that? Do you kind of find it's easier, or do you kind of find that okay. there's a little? Well, so when I read a story, often, not all the time, but often, even if it's in third person, 
It's in someone's point of view. Okay, that's what I was right. Yeah. So yeah. I, for the most part, and this is, I mean, uh, I had a coach that that told me this, and it helps helps me so much. Is I treat third person almost almost exactly how mm-hmm. I would treat a first person, as far as like the emotional okay. connection to it. But the difference for me would be if. And I don't, I don't do this much because my voice isn't, you know, it isn't aged appropriately. But if I was doing a book where there was a 16 year old doing, you know, a 16 year old point of view, um, Mm -hmm. if it was a first person point of view from a 16 year old, I would Mm -hmm. age my voice down a bit. Like I would, I would narrate Mm -hmm. in a voice that's kind of like this, right? Like I would, I would change my voice similar to what a character voice would be. Pardon me? Direct. It doesn't sound disconnected. It just doesn't no. sound in exact character. Yes, but it's just it's like because you, you're in their head, right? You are that character in right. first person, and in third person, I wouldn't change my voice, but I would right. keep the emotional connection that I would have if I right. was doing it in first person. If that makes sense. No, that that's, makes perfect. That's interesting. You guys talking about that POV because. Um, And I posed this question on on one of the videos I made, you know, just my regular content. And, uh, you know, as as a writer, whether I'm writing in first person or third, I have never felt a difference in the connection I am feeling with the character that I'm in at that point. It's just, Mm -hmm. am I, do I want to have multi, do I want to see multiple points of view because the plot should be that way? Or uh, do I only want the reader to see one point of view because that's going to, make the reveals better and that's gonna you know depending on what type of book it is and that's you know what i determine whether or not it's first or third because if it's only one character Mm -hmm. why would i go third if i can just do first if i'm gonna have one character the whole way through um right but uh you know and and i'm gonna do uh you know kind of a funny version of this on my regular uh feed but um whenever people say write what you know uh there's some truth to that yes you know i definitely I'll write a lot of the stuff that has happened to me in terms of experience. But what that phrase really means, because, you know, a fantasy writer, you know, can hardly do that if they're world building and they're slaying dragons or doing whatever. But it's the mm-hmm. emotional truths that you know. That's the no that, you, that you're writing. And so, yes, whether it's first person or third person, that's what you, uh, as a writer, we're trying to infuse into whatever we're writing. If we are, um, you know... Uh, work in the craft like we should be right and there are definitely books where if it's written in third person yes you can feel more more disconnected uh, but you know and and there's this term that's come uh come around called deep third person point of view and the first time i heard that i'm like what does that mean that means writing in third person but it, it feels like it's first person and it's like yeah. but why why does your third person not feel like first person you, you know mm-hmm. oh uh, uh tanya wants to oh, say something oh, she he, Tanya is trying to get your attention hardcore. Right yeah, now. yeah, she, yeah, she is. What, what's up? What's Rick. up? I think she wants you to block someone. Oh, I guess uh, I guess we'll wait. Okay, so there's someone called Landers apparently that is all right. Oh. So uh, Landers, let's see. Any, 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 anybody anybody know how to do that? Uh, well, I'm take care of the farms and ignore this. All right, all right I'm sorry. Um, what world do you live in? Um, <laughs> voice isn't meant for acting it's meant for the farm uh, oh I, okay, I was this? wondering I was wondering what that was alright so let me see how I can uh, if you hold if, down if, on the game it, just press on his thing it should swag it or give you an option to swag it alright so I have, to, I have to find him I am so sorry that I don't know how to do this guys it must, uh, it's okay <laughs> I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna lose all of our viewers. Here we go. There we go. Oh, okay, okay. Here we go. I'm um, I'm pressing in. All right. Uh, you are wow. meant for boys wear copperhead. Yeah, yeah no man. joke, right? One hundred percent. I can't right. wait to hear your samples. I'm gonna listen. Uh, no, I, I blocked him, and I think that was uh, what what the option he gave me. All right. Yeah, if you blocked, I think that that does it. All right. I'm not sure what so, the heck. That is. Holy heck! All right. Okay. You know, so, now, so now that's another thing I know how to do now. Now that I'm doing live. <laughs> talk about you talk about TikTok being like so 
accepting and stuff like that. That is legitimately the one and only time so far I have seen or heard anyone who is like, bro, what are you doing? Like, I kid you not, that live right now is, yes, ma'am. That is the only ever heard it. Like, there's been some people, I speak hard, there have been some people who, like, even the one that, like, the video I did where I'm telling, like, you know, hey, kiddos, front and center, like, come on, like, stop driving your mama crazy. Like, some people were like, uh, cringe. I think it was, like, one dude who commented that. But that is legitimately the only, yeah, copper's first troll. Like, really, what that is. It's got to happen sometime. Because I've expected it a lot more. Really? And still beside myself in that. I mean, everything from this, Instagram, the Patreon. I've really heard no trolls at all, really. Same like, here, actually. Yeah, now that you bring it up. Yeah. I mean, I've heard people who are stalker-ish, but that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, but really, not a whole lot of negativity. And it's... Yeah. It, it's funny that uh, I just find it again. I'm beside myself where it's like, hold on, none of y'all hate me that much. Like you sure? Like you sure, right? How could they hate you though? I mean, when you when you put out Man, such positivity, I can give you a long list of things. Of... <laughs> <laughs> well, I I, I made uh, I I figured out how to make Tanya a moderator. And so I think she's going to be able to to do whatever needs to be done there. Uh, so thank you. And I will do that from now on whenever you're there. Uh, nice. uh, so, yeah. And, and, you know, it's true. I didn't think it was going to be a problem, right? Because I have not had anybody troll me. And, and you know, even, even in normal comments. I've had trolls. I had someone. It was interesting. I, I had someone who came on and he kept saying it wasn't wasn't necessarily inappropriate things it was just he was he was trolling and i kept blocking him but he kept popping up under a new username like within a mm -hmm. second mm -hmm. and i thought oh my gosh this guy has probably 20 different accounts yep. with similar names Wait. and no don't keep, keep on. i don't want to interrupt you i'm sorry no i mean it that I think he just probably sets it up that way so that he knows I, he's yeah, so i guess for me it were i guess for me it's one of those things where I'm like, um, quick question. How bad is life? <laughs> How bad is life that are that we've okay? referred to? Are, are you okay? Mm. Are you okay? <laughs> what can I do to help you? So, yeah. You talking about having need a hand here. So Yeah, it's it's never it's never about the person yep. they're attacking. It's it's always something else. But so whatever one of one of my jobs What are you gonna say? What did you say? No, I'm saying y'all keep going. I'll be back in about five minutes. All right. Okay. All right. Can do. Can do. Uh, so, so you'll, you'll appreciate this, Angela, as a former uh, journalist. So uh, one of my jobs that I had at the newspaper was to uh, moderate the comments on our website whenever I was the low man on the, oh. the, 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 the brand new digital, the brand new digital team. And, uh, you know, we had a corporate re, uh, company restructuring and, you know, that's where I went from sports to that because I was young and I had taken the online publishing classes at UT and college and stuff. So it was a natural fit, but you know, I got the kind of the, the shit detail whenever I first started of moderating comments on the website. And there would be times whenever somebody uh, just absolutely uh, would not give up, you know, they, they wanted to give out somebody's uh, address, you know, if we wrote a story about them and they didn't like, and they were doxing is what they, that was before doxing was a thing. They were just trying to do that or just being nasty or mean or whatever it was. And so I would delete the comment and uh, then they would try to comment again. I would do that and I would block them, you know, cause we had a procedure, you know, that we had to follow. And then they would just, I would spend all afternoon just like people would create accounts using a new Gmail and I would just have to kick them off and figure out who they were. And that could consume hours of my afternoon, just trying to, uh, you know, put down these same people who just kept creating these free accounts. And of course, Websites are much more sophisticated now, and that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, in the early days of having a website and, you know, opening up your comments, man, that was uh, 
that could the be newspaper. you know my entire shift would be newspaper just... comments newspaper yeah. comments on their websites i mean i just i was like just shut it down i mean the papers that i worked for they didn't even they didn't even go through the comments they didn't they didn't edit them they didn't delete them they just left them there and i'm just like just shut it down like there's no nothing productive happening in this space and i remember writing a story about a woman and her family and um the comments section people were horrible they were horrible criticizing her appearance criticizing her everything about her and her life and and she called me crying on the phone the next day after the story had been published at, like begging us to take down the story because the comments were just so painful for her to look at and i just thought like this this does not contribute at all to the conversation this is not why we're here this is not the purpose yeah I mean, and, that... and we would have people if we shut down the comments on a story right they would go on every other story on our website and they would start commenting there uh you know and they would be like oh you're gonna shut down the comments on all your stories for today ha <laughs> ha and and yeah, and, and so like if, if they're commenting on a story about a person, a feature you're talking about, Tanya's right, that poor person. And so one of the reasons why we started doing comment moderation was A, you know, the subjects of our stories would sometimes complain, but it was also a legal issue sometimes. They were doing stuff that we could get sued for. And so, yeah, like I, I'm so glad. And, uh, you know, it, it, it seems like, you know, having trolls on here is not as big a deal, but uh, now I know that that comment, mod that, that moderation um, tool is there for a reason. Um, <laughs> that, that, so well, that sounds more stressful than my job. It was very stressful. No, like uh, the stress that, and, and I know, you know, defending reporters is not in style right now, but the stress that reporters, mm -hmm. daily journalism, what they go through uh, is really, it's, it's bad and it's, it's just not worth the money, right? Like, it, it, like you know, lawyers and, and, and doctors, we're not doing anything as stressful as that. But, you know, we're, we're still doing stressful stuff. Or even people who we're working out on the pipeline, people who operate heavy machinery and stuff, you know, they have stressful jobs, but they are pretty well compensated in most of those mm -hmm. fields. When you're, put, when you're putting up with that kind of stress and, you know, you're making twenty five to $30,000 uh, a year, it just becomes – you know, you, your life at work is just stressful and awful. And then you go home and you can't pay your bills. I mean, that kind of double double stress is just not there. If, if you're in a profession that's stressful, but you're making, you know, six figures a year, whenever you can leave that job, then, you know, you're not, you don't have a lot of that added pressure. Uh, frontline hospital work. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, nurses probably don't get paid enough. Although sometimes, you know, traveling nurses, I know that they get a good stipend. Um, and, and so, you know, teachers are another one teachers. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, they do not get paid near enough. You could not pay me enough to be a teacher because a, uh, oh I don't God. think I would be very good at it. Hi, hi, bunny mama. Hi, April. Um, but, <laughs> but yes, you know, it, it, you know, the stress that teachers have to go through for what they get paid, uh, is not mm -hmm. enough. And for me personally, language arts teachers are absolute, you know, uh, rock stars, you know, because they're the reasons why I've done mm -hmm. just about everything I've done in my adult life. Um, yeah, and, and so uh, teachers in the U.S. I'm I'm stunned by by the amount or how little teachers are paid in the U.S. It is so different up here. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the pensions are great up here. Teachers are still, you know, they're fighting for for pay raises and things, but I I can't I just can't believe it. I mean. It feels like something worth investing. Well, all in my Instagram, the whole reason why my Instagram, why the name on it is Dark Rose Actual, is because I had I had this idea and I tried to essentially get it to take off, and I might still try to make this work. But for me, so you see a lot of different apparel companies. You've got everything from wounded warrior article 15 um all these guys but those are all veteran run they help other veterans which is awesome you've got uh black helmet syndicate which mainly their thing is it's like it's like black rifle coffee but for firemen because firemen go yeah. they go through and it's awesome and i'm glad they exist i'm so happy for them and i love that people from that profession 
are literally building their own companies that are building up other people in the profession. What I had the idea for, and I will still, if I ever, um, if I need to, um, you know, reach out to more people, I will. And I'd like to get this started at some point. Where Dark Rose came from is that whether it's the artist who's struggling, the nurse who is a single mom, the oil pipeline worker who, you know, never sees his kids but is working for them every day. There's darkness that comes with that, but you're still one of the most beautiful people that most people can be. So that's where Dark Rose comes from. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind it is that it would essentially be a, <clears throat> pardon me, is that it would essentially be almost like a wounded warriors, but for all these different lines of work, because like article 15, if you are a veteran and you want someone where you have like a company that gets you and stuff like that, there's article 15. If you're a firefighter, you have black helmets in the kit. If you're a police officer, you have this and you have this. Where is that for the nurse who's a single mom? Where is that for the pipeline worker, the landscaper, the this, the that, all these people that the, the teacher who has been teaching for 20 something years and she does it not because the money's good, but because she loves what she does. And if you asked 9.99999 of every single one of her students who their favorite teacher was, hands down, every time they would say it's her. And for me, it was like, where the living heck is the support for these people? Where the living heck is the, is the group that builds up those people? And there really isn't one. And there are, but you have to look for them. And I basically, it was the idea of I wanted something where, listen, if you, if you love what you do, if you go through the darkness and the hurt and the turmoil of this and this and this not only do we have a place for you but we have a place for you that you can find other people who do it and i think the problem is and i've seen it i've seen it become less of a thing over the years it used to be and it's hard because some some experiences are very singular obviously the military ex experience is very singular but i'm sorry i've seen and especially COVID, as much as COVID mm. the whole world, COVID brought a lot of people together on things. Because now, instead of having all of these distractions, here's my world, here's what I do, if other people do it, cool. You had all these people who were like, oh, shoot, people in this job completely different from what I do go through a lot of the similar things that I do. Oh, damn. And mm came together on that and it was really something and again I will I, it's one of those things where it's it's still in the back of my brain and it's one of those things where it's is one of those things where when I get the chance and I have enough influence to I gladly want to start it but I've been very happy to see that over time like especially nurses I'm sorry I've been thanking nurses since I was this big and part of that is because I've got nurses, I've got medical workers in my family. And I would find it funny when nurses would be like, oh, thank you for your service. I'm like, ma'am, thank you for your service. Like, people don't thank our nurses enough. And it kind of drives me crazy that it took COVID for people to be like, yeah. oh, my God, nurses and doctors, thank you so much. It's like, sweetheart, they've yeah. been doing for COVID. Yeah. But people forget, though. People forget. Yeah. Yeah. This is... And, mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I, this is what we're experiencing up here. People mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fortunate to live in... Uh, so Amarillo is a bit of a medical hub for uh, for really um, a, a pretty big swath of the, the Southwest. We have a couple of the biggest hospitals. We have a couple of the best nursing schools. And and so, yeah, like they are always, you know, at the at the forefront of our thinking up here. And so we definitely like have, um, you know, organizations and drives every year that are, you know, thank, thank you for, you know, your service to nurses. But it was mm -hmm. surprising whenever COVID happened, 
Um, yeah, yeah, a travel healthcare worker from Texas and New Mexico, exactly. And that's, you know, like a BSA in Northwest here in Amarillo. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, like we were having to have nurses come in whenever usually I am in Amarillo, uh, ours <laughs> on Mercury. Uh, uh, yes, and, and so, you know, we, we were having to get nurses, usually our nurses go places whenever bad things happen because, you know, we have such a, a big med medical community up here. And so the news, those news stories come out of COVID. I was like, wow, there are places uh, on, on, this, uh, on this planet that, you know, don't have, you know, great uh, big medical staffs that you can go to. You don't have to, you know, a lot of times here, it's like, oh, which uh, went to surgical tech school in Amarillo. I'm like, awesome. I, uh, you know, and we have the Texas Tech uh, um, healthcare system, uh, you know, has a campus up here uh, in Amarillo. And so it was like, oh, there are places that have, you know, like you hear about food deserts, they have like nurse deserts and like, you know, uh, frontline healthcare worker deserts. And it's like, that's not something mm -hmm. I've experienced. So it was a, it, that was a wake up call to me. It was like, oh, not everywhere is, is fortunate enough to have the kind of expert medical community and resources that we have here, because here, you know, it's, you know, my sister just had to have uh, an MRI on her knee because it uh, turns out she blew out her ACL and MCL uh, doing uh, one of those tough man Spartan races. And so, you know, she had to get an MRI and they were, you know, it was like 1030 at night was whenever it was scheduled because we just have basically 24 um, seven, you know, medical facilities here, private practice, or we get to which hospital uh, to oh. think that, you know, other places just oh. don't have that was eye opening for me. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. And I, I think the big thing is that what has, what, what drives me crazy is because unfortunately, and this is something I don't think we'll ever, ever, ever fully be able to fix is that people are fickle. Um, very small example, Carhartt, like wearing the Carhartt brand and wearing like blue collar style to where kids are flicking paint at their jackets to make it seem like it, it's a trend. It's oh, wow. people are thick. And I think a lot of it comes from like Yellowstone. Yellowstone is popular now. So mm -hmm. now people are like, oh, the blue color working man that does this and this. Oh yeah. That, and they try to emulate that. And it's like, dude, th this has always been a thing. There have always <laughs> In men and women who work themselves to the bone oh, yeah. every single day, not because it pays a lot, not yeah. because it gets a lot of this and this, but because they love what they do and they have their priorities straight. And don't get me wrong. I'm very happy to see that be a trend. I'm very happy to see blue collar become like popular now Makes and bring to it. I'm very happy for that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> But to me, it's one of those things where it's like, why, why should it take a show or a pandemic to, to bring light to that? Like, why? And, you know, even as far as reporters go or as radio goes, like all these things that people go through. And I think that that's part of why in this community, we kind of have the building up that we do, because I think the problem I won't say problem, but I think the the condition that we have is that people are people. It, it's constantly a I don't want to say dick swing contest, but it really is. It's <laughs> my struggle is hard, and if I acknowledge someone's struggle, it brings less struggle to mine. It's like mm. no, same. But what a reporter goes through, what a person who works in the radio goes through, what a voice actor goes through, what I go through, this and this and that, they're all valid they're all yep. they're all beautiful within their own right and i think that it's not until you've experienced suffering that you want to do the best you can to prevent it in other people yeah it's not yeah. until you've experienced hardship that yeah. you want to make things easier on others and it's not until you've been at the end of your rope that you want to use the last bit of rope you have to pull someone else up. Yeah. And it's, you know, again, it's sad. It's one of those things where I'm so happy to see that within this community. And I think, but 
at least from what I've observed so far, you two are obviously much more involved in the community than I am because I'm just. I've only been on it. TikTok a year, so I don't know if that. Uh... Well, <laughs> well, but I don't so much mean TikTok. I mean the the creative part. Oh right? yes, the, okay, 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 yeah. yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like where a lot of that stems from is that you know what it's like to be fighting alone. And yeah. rather than faded, grumpy, pissed off about it, and be like, well, I didn't have help. Why should you? You've <laughs> been there and you want to help other people not be there. Yeah. You, you want to give to others what you never had. And... If I'm not wrong, to me, it seems like that's what creates that sort of thing within this community. Rather than a, well, it sucked for me, ergo, it should suck for you. It's a, no, I want to leave, when I eventually leave this business, this world, whatever, I want it to be better than when I got in it. Yeah, yeah. that's 100%. Yeah. 100% mm -hmm. it. Because I think also as creatives, and I'm sure there are people who are non-creatives who are this way, but we are raw nerves, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, our, our business is feeling things and, mm -hmm. and understanding how we're feeling things, but really feeling things deeply. And in this industry, as supportive as it is, we are also dealing with criticism and rejection mm -hmm. every time, every day, multiple mm -hmm. times a day. And feeling those feelings and understanding when other people are going through those moments, how they're how they're feeling and and i think yeah the, like the sense that for me i mean i i don't want anyone to feel like that because it's it is isolating it's a lonely place to be and i know every creative is going to go through it and that's just mm -hmm. you know it doesn't help you move yeah forward. and and for me you know because you know i i feel like you know i i grew up in a you know similar way to you two very uh, keep your head down, nose to the grindstone, don't show your emotion. I had to, whenever I decided I was really going to do this thing and I was really going to try to write fiction and to try to bring characters and stories to life, I had to learn how to tap into those emotions and to and to feel them. Uh, and, and so I don't, like a lot of people are born with that ability. And, you know, I feel like, you know, I've always been empathetic, but being able to uh, allow myself to experience those and to put that on the page uh, was something that I had to learn, uh, you know, and I, I didn't learn it until, you know, I was in revisions in my first novel and, you know, I, I gave it to someone and they're like, you know, uh, do you, what are you feeling when you write this? And I was in journalism mode. I was like, well, I'm, I'm not feeling anything. I'm, you know, sitting down there like, so, and, and this is true probably of a lot of different kinds of art, but uh, it's very true um, uh, in writing. I feel like if you are not feeling the emotions when you're writing, the reader is not going to uh, feel those emotions either. And so I might have been Robert Frost, uh, you know, who said if there's no emotion in the writer, there's no emotion in the reader. And I, I tell young writers that a lot whenever we're just talking about stuff is like, you know, whenever you're writing the, the climax of your thriller, you know, uh, are, do you feel is your heart beating faster are you pounding the keyboard? Like, you know, are you really in there and focused? Because if you're not, then you're not channeling the emotion you need into that scene. Now, if it doesn't happen, you know, during the uh, first draft, you can still get there during revisions. I'll be re revising someone else's novel and I'm getting to, uh, you know, a, a scene that has a lot of emotion in it. And I will be sitting there like, you know, my I know my eyes are wider than normal and I'm, you know, um, mm -hmm. and so even as an editor, uh, I can do that, which even if editing is a little more science than art, if you're doing fiction, it's, you still have to have uh, some of that stuff. And But, you know, channeling that emotion into and feeling it so, um, you know, right here on your skin that you can let it happen as you're working uh, is something that I feel is important. And I, I can tell, I think, when I read a book where that hasn't happened, when they're telling me the story, and that goes back to showing versus telling, which I don't know mm -hmm. if, if that's a thing in the, in the in the voice actor world, but in writing, that's a cliche to even say it at this point is, you know, you want to show versus tell. And, you know, some people don't quite understand what that means. And the way I explain it to them is um, showing is you as the writer uh, feeling what that character is going through and then uh, transferring that feeling onto the page 
through what you're doing. And of course, quite literally, it means, um, you know, to have the character's face go flush instead of saying she got angry. You know, I mean, I, like yeah. literally, that's what it means. But but in, in practice, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to feel that emotion and you are mm. trying to get that emotion onto the page. And then telling, of course, is the opposite is she was angry. She was hurt. And that is the 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 report the the reportage that some people do whenever they're just telling their story and, and that that is good for getting a story out but it is not good for um, getting the reader to be totally immersed and how do you make that happen you work on it you know like I said I just now feel like I'm getting good at that my critique group is giving me that feedback that I have finally gotten to that place where I can do that. And, you know, uh, I've been doing this seriously since 2017, and I, I have four novels out there where I started getting better at it. And maybe this one, I'll finally really get to that place where I want to be. Um, is there something similar to show versus tell in your world, in the voice acting world? Angela? <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it would be, it would be connect. Don't read, just don't read it. Don't, um, oh, what's the word now? It, now it escapes me. But um, it's it's about connecting with it emo at an emotional level and performing it um, rather than rather than reading it. There's there's a specific I don't know. There's Ali in the comments. You might know exactly. You might know the words that I'm thinking of. But yeah, I mean, you don't want to just read it, right? You want to connect with it, um, which is which is important. And I think that's the same. That's a similar concept, I think. Um, and, and it, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, how Copperhead, when you were saying, when you talk into the camera or into your phone, you're, you're talking to the person, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm speaking into the microphone, I'm telling a story to a person right there. So I'm mm -hmm. not talking like this and reading the story like this. I'm talking mm -hmm. like I am in your ear and telling you a story mm -hmm. and and with all of the emotion so, that comes along with it. So, so Ali, Ali says the trick is not performing it, but living the story as, as yeah. you tell it, which, yeah, that's very similar. Like yeah. whenever I'm telling the story through my, through my fingertips, I am trying to be in that moment. And that's why recently I've been writing more um, present tense as opposed to past tense. And there are some mm -hmm. people uh, I learned because I asked on, you know, on my normal content and I got a lot of feedback is, they don't. Uh, they don't enjoy reading present tense because a lot of writers don't write in it. But, uh, mm. but man, I, I have felt that whenever I do that, even if I were to have to go back and completely put it in third person, because that's the way the publisher, whoever needed it, if I'm writing the first draft in present tense, that makes me as the author feel like I'm there experiencing that stuff. And I'm writing my current novel in first person because uh, I want to only have the one character and I want to really uh, take uh, readers through that one character's journey. Uh, so that first person present tense, I, you know, I absolutely, when I sit down to write, you know, I have to feel like I'm in that moment because the tense that I'm writing in demands it and the POV that I'm writing in demands it. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think that uh, because I like to write that way anyway, those might be my go-to points of view and tenses from now on. And I've written other stuff in present tense and I've never had anyone, uh, you know, say that they didn't enjoy it or why did you do that? And I've even had uh, Let the Guilty Pay, uh, you know, the second novel I put out, the one that is, uh, has the best critical acclaim so far. Um, you have a character, you know, there's the present, and that's in present tense. And then you have three points of view in the past, and that's written in past tense. And that was done very deliberately as a, um, a literary device, because one's happening right now, and one is um, happening in the past. And again, I didn't get feedback that it, you know, that they didn't enjoy it. So... I, uh, I feel like that um, writing in that present tense, uh, even, even if I have to change it later, is helping me do that. It's helping me. I am experiencing this right now as a writer, mm -hmm. especially in the first draft for the first time. So what am I feeling and how, how does that, you know, how does that, uh, how does that manifest itself is what I was trying to say. Uh, so like, even if I think, okay, he would be angry right now, but if I actually put myself in that situation, I can, okay, I can feel where, you know, that anger is coming from. Is it coming from my belly? Is it my heart that's aching? You know, what's happening? So um, I have found that that is what's helping me at the moment anyway. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree with you. And um, it's, there's actually, it, it's weird. There's a lot of things in my life that some of them are really big moments 
that like stick in my head. And some of them are like small moments that in the grand scheme of things are relatively small, but they stick in my head. And there's this one moment that this was a couple of years ago. I was writing, going back to ghost writing, actually, I was writing something for someone who actually, Miss Angela, you would probably appreciate this, in the realm of romance. Um, okay. That for them. <laughs> and I will never forget that I, there was a certain piano piece that because I tend to have a very film centered brain. Um, for me, it's I have this scene that I'm really watching in my head. And then as I write, I'm essentially describing that as it's happening. And I will never forget this. I will never forget this. I remember that I was writing and I had this piano piece in the background and as I'm typing it. And there became a point where I actually closed my eyes. And as I was typing, it was almost like I was playing the keys of the piano while I'm hearing it. And I just, I let myself go. Mm -hmm. And I'm literally typing as I'm, as if I'm playing the keys of the piano. I remember I sent it off to a friend of mine and she gets back to me. She's like, where was this? I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, where has this been the whole time? I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you wrote this so eloquently mm. and very much sucked me into there. Where was this? And I was like, oh, saying I suck. She's like, no, but <laughs> this is by mm -hmm. far some of the you've ever sent me. Where did this come from? And it's kind of like what you were saying is that you, you, you let yourself, the, the experience of writing it, this, let me reword that, the experience of reading it doesn't just pull you in the experience of writing it pulls you it, it's you can't it, it goes into that phrase you can't make this stuff up no. you, you can't pull that out of nowhere it has to come from somewhere that in and of itself is emotionable and has this equity to it that you can't just bang out real quick and then you're done and kind of goes into the whole bit, at least for me, of write what you know. Some of the best of what I have written, and maybe five, ten people on this earth have read um, yet. Um, but they tell me, they're like, dude, I was there. And it's things that I've written because while I'm writing it, th there's not a scene that I'm like, ah, how do I want this to look? It's, I am this character. I am this person i am feeling this directly and i'm essentially just writing down as if i'm telling the story that's never happened and that's essentially what i'm doing i'm writing the story that never happened but and it that's happened. that's the magic of storytelling right and that's the <laughs> magic that like when when people talk about you know they say like how, how do you how do you write a novel how do you and this was a question that i you know got asked and and you know i did a video to answer like how uh, how do you get, you know, uh, what's in your head onto the page? And that is something all writers wish we, if we could yeah. bottle that up and sell it you, to other people, we, we, we would. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and it, but it's like, it's reaching that place uh, where, you, where you are able to do that. And then like me, whenever I come out of a writing session where I was able to do that, that is one of the times whenever I get that serotonin and that dopamine and, yeah. you know, get that sort of, it's like a writer's high is how I would describe it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen every time. You know, there are definitely times where I, I put the words down and, and it was a little bit of a struggle, but I at least got to where I needed to go. And then, you know, the next day when I sit down, it's a different scene and that scene comes alive for me. And that's why we revise so that we can get in there. And like I said, if you, if you do your job revising, you also get to that place and you're re you're reworking stuff. Um, but yeah, like that is one of the things that, uh, it keeps me wanting to keep writing. Right. It's like, it's a little bit like for me, golf, I'm not very good at golf, but you know, about <laughs> four or five times around, I hit that great shot, you know, I, or I get like two or three pars and maybe a birdie and the rest of them might be double triple bogeys, but it's those shots and how good they made me feel that keep me wanting to go back to the golf course, you know, at least, uh, you know, a few times whenever the weather is good enough around here. 
Uh, let's see. Tony yeah. needs to get my attention again, it seems like. But, uh, but yeah, like, like you know. Molly's leaving. Str- Molly's leaving. Let's say goodbye to Molly. Oh, bye, I'm Molly. Say. bye Molly. Bye. We appreciate bye. you being oh, here. Bye, Paige. Oh, oh, and page two. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's nine it's nine fifteen. I didn't realize that. Holy cow! <laughs> oh, ten fifteen. <laughs> we were we were having such a good time. Time just flies, doesn't it? Yeah, and like you know, we don't. Uh, I know that uh, I had to plug in my phone, but I think you know it's uh it's charging battery. So um, so all 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 good there. And uh, you know, thank you, Tanya, for I know that you've been answering people's questions whenever we can't get to all the uh, all the comments and <laughs> awkwardly <laughs> exiting. Hey. You know, like that's how it is in real life, though. How are, it's it's hard to leave to leave a fun party, man. It's uh, it, it, it's not easy. And I appreciate all the likes that you're given on your way out. That's uh, I know that that's like important to the TikTok live gods, whatever whatever they got mm-hmm. going on in the rankings and all that stuff. And thank you for being here. And thanks everyone who's still here. I can't believe it because because uh, Michael got us off to such a good start a couple hours ago by telling people he's going to be here. I don't think we dropped below like 75 viewers this whole time, which is uh, which is kind of in, we were, kind of incredible. You know, we were sitting at like five hundred something at one point, were we? Yeah, no, it's uh, <laughs> it, it's it's been it's been pretty nice. But I also think too that uh, uh, people have enjoyed how, even though uh, I'm calling the show Book Talk on Book Talk, we're talking a lot more about uh, philosophy. And I know people enjoyed when we were talking about um, you know the, the the pay gap for the frontline workers. Um, oh, and then Tiny needs to say something, so. <laughs> Hey, Tanya. What, what, what she got? Yes, ma'am. Big sister speaks. We're here. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, the yeah, comments yeah. always come in a little slow. Oh, yeah. They always come in a little well, slow. Oh, there's that delay. Yeah. Yeah. That right. Delay. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, Spooky, we are glad that you found uh, Copperhead because he <laughs> is wonderful. And uh, thank you for loving the live tonight, uh, Shy OC. I am so sorry. I cannot pronounce that. Um, but, uh, but I'm glad you've enjoyed it and let's see, I'm not sure, Hey, I guess, I'm not sure what, what? time you needed. She's either, listen, she's either still typing it or yeah. it's okay. oh, still typing it. She she. All right. I think it's, I think that's the beauty of being a creative though. It's that flow that like, you just don't know where it comes from that, yeah mysterious place that it flows from and i like Thank you, I, girl. I oh there's some people who have, have who to have go to, to work have to go to work oh. that it's like late and people got work in the morning oh yeah 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 right right <laughs> uh, all right well i i think that um i think we probably ought to wrap, wrap it up leave, uh, leave it like okay kids okay kids yeah. let's no exa- exactly yeah yeah exactly I should I should uh, I should have put an alarm on my phone. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, thank you two for being here. Um, Thanks for having you know, me. That's really good fun. Night, Amy. So uh, yes, yeah. yes, Angela. I'm I'm so glad that yes, uh, yes, uh, it is it is an unpaid job, Tony, that you do, and you are mm-hmm. you are volunteering, and you are great. Um, but thank you uh, for coming, Angela. Like I know that uh, you know, Tony, you've been trying to 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 get fun. us. Um, <laughs> together for a while and and michael uh, great as always you know we'll have to i'm gonna put out an actual schedule um over thanksgiving and try to decide i'm gonna have to say okay which nights are going to be when i write during the night and not during the day and i do this and you know we can have themes i don't know like voice actors and then we'll have other writers on one night like uh but i definitely think twice a week is probably where it's gonna have to gonna have to go um yeah yeah back good night and back to writing yeah uh, uh, does your creator name matter? I don't think so. Um, but yes, thank you too for being here. We're going to wrap this up. Thank you it's for funny. everyone. And if you came late and didn't hear the whole discussion, uh, I really am, uh, you know, I'm sorry that we can't keep going, but, uh, you know, some, some of us do have to go to work. I suppose I work from home, so I don't even really, Hey, there's Ray. Thanks for the fist bump, buddy. He's one of the authors yep. of blue handle. And, yeah. uh, I referenced his book at least once tonight. Um, and thank you, Shackworth. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, for everybody else saying thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, we would not be doing this if we didn't have people watching and interacting. So um, thank, thank my guests. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Michael. 
Uh, we're going to wrap it up. And thank you, TikTok. We will be back after the Thanksgiving break. And happy Thanksgiving, early Thanksgiving, to everyone who yeah. celebrates. Happy Thanksgiving. Nope. The one time, well, second time of year, y'all can get fat and no one can judge you. <laughs> Sweatpants all day, baby. No, I won't be much. All day. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in sweatpants right now. Like it's uh, when you work from home, uh, you know, it's definitely not not a given that I'm going to wear pants every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. Take care, guys. Good chatting with you both. Oh. Bye.